Here is your podcast. You know, I've been doing this show nine years. In the beginning, it was great. I got to show up and just talk and leave. That was fantastic. But now Mech sends me this theme song, tells me to put my own voice in it. Lily shows up. She doesn't produce a goddamn thing. All she does is laugh, turn around, and go home. The only thing I don't wind up doing for this show is listen to it. That's your fucking job. Hey, what's happening? Mike Schmidt, 40-year-old boy podcast. Perhaps I should say, Asalaamu As Alaikum. What's happening? Uh, that's nuts. Peace be upon you. What's happening? I don't think it's a good translation. Uh, I, I, I keep trying. You know, it's funny because I posted a bunch of stuff on Facebook. First of all, let's talk about this. I'm in a hotel room as I broadcast this. You can probably I'm broadcasting. I don't know if you know this is live. Um, you can probably hear the vent behind me. Uh, it's an air conditioning thing because you need to have the air conditioning cranked up at all times because it is. Uh, I, I mean, dude, it's fucking it's 98 at three in the morning in this fucking country. Uh, hi, I'm in Kuwait. Have I mentioned that? Um and I got I got to tell you, dudes, I have fucking started this show six, eight times eight, and stopped because uh, I've talked myself into thinking that this show needs to be something different because I'm in a different place and I'm doing different things. And that's the fucking weirdest thing in the world. And it's because I'm alone. I think that's probably it. Like if I had Lily here, she'd fucking grab me by the lapels because I wear a suit when I'm in Kuwait. You know me. <laughs> I went ahead and I bought a fucking linen seersucker because I got to go meet Humphrey Bogart and sell him the Maltese fucking Falcon. Uh, I, 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 I sat down to do the show and I kept trying to, this is late, by the way, this is going up very late. Um, it's, I, what is it? Friday? It might be Friday morning as I put this up. I, I honestly, that's another thing. I have no fucking idea what time it is. I mean, I know what time it is here, but I never know what time it is or what day it is anywhere else. Like, I believe it's Friday here in the morning already, but it's still nighttime back in, in I was going to say California, the United States. I mean, fuck, it's 8,000 miles away. Um, and I don't even know why I'm sharing this with you, but I have to, you know why? Because I fucking, if I don't talk about it, then it's just, it's phony. And I, so I have to talk about what's going on. I can't, I, I've sat here and fucking stared and tried and tried to record and talked. And I keep thinking it's got to be something different than what it usually is. But in reality, it's just me being a fucking jackass. And that's the whole fucking show. It's not like there's going to be some level of import. I don't have to sit here and put on a fucking graduation gown or be like a professor in glasses and have a fucking chalkboard. I just got to tell you about what the fuck is going on. And what's going on is me in Kuwait. It's just me visiting and me having a good time. Uh, but I always think that I've got, oh, well, you know, because I posted a lot of stuff on Facebook that was like a travelogue where I was talking about what I had done and where I had gone and the things that I had seen. And then I'm like, well, nobody's going to want to see those things. But in reality, fucking only a, 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 a one twelfth of you are seeing me on Facebook. And, that, and that's even low. Probably one one thousandth of you. That's also probably high. No, that's really low. Actually, one one thousandth is lower than one twelfth. Fuck. Uh, I will tell you this, too. Ahmad has asked me a, a couple of times. He's like, hey, when are you going to do the podcast? Because his friends want to hear how I talk about them. And, uh, and I can't imagine them like I should, I should get it out early here in the fucking show so they can hear it and then not have to listen to the rest of this. <laughs> Cause I don't think these dudes are going to want to hear me talking in circles about how the fuck I can't broadcast and do a real show because I can't figure out exactly how to talk about things that are going on in my fucking life. And they're going to be like, why that? This isn't the dude we met. Although I guess it's kind of the dude they met. Uh, cause they give me that fucking side eye look. I, I had dinner with them. I'll get into it in a few minutes. But, uh, but I've met, uh, I met a bunch of his friends and, um, we know me. I'm a little uh, frenetic, but I'm not frenetic with them. Like I've kind of dialed it way down. And also I'm not frenetic in a fucking another country because I don't want to deal with the secret police or whoever the fuck is observing me because I am getting looks. I will tell you that. Fuck, that's all coming up. See, this is what I didn't want to do. I thought to myself, well, I should talk about stuff in order. But then, you know how their show is. There's there's no fucking order anywhere. It's just me talking. Whatever the fucking spills out, spills out. And I got to remember to go back and double back and tell you about what's happening. But I'm here in the Hilton broadcasting right now and it is uh it is nighttime it is out outside it is uh dark but you can see the water i have a great view of the persian gulf from my window how fucking weird is that normally i'm doing this and i see lou the racist bartender getting his mail <laughs> today i'm broadcasting staring out at the fucking persian gulf i gotta stop saying broadcasting i'm recording uh, because uh, broadcasting when it was going out live uh, and I'll tell you what, I'm glad it wasn't going out live because I went and did fucking eight different stop starts of this goddamn show. That would be boring. That would be terrible for a fucking sponsor. If they listened to the show, they're like, all right, put another commercial in. 
All right, put another commercial in because this guy can't fucking keep talking. What the fuck is his problem? Well, it's because he thinks he's supposed to do something important. Why the fuck is he doing it? It's a podcast. Doesn't he fucking realize that? Well, yes, he does. But he maybe wants to have some sort of, he doesn't want to betray anybody. He doesn't want to, he wants to make sure he tells the story right. Well, doesn't he have instincts and doesn't he know that he does that? Does it all the time? Well, yeah, he does. But at the same time, he winds up questioning himself because he's alone in a fucking hotel room in the echo chamber is him just staring at a goddamn wall or looking out at the Persian Gulf. Yeah, but uh, this is what the producer's job is. Yeah, but she's not there. She's busy in Albany, whatever the fuck she is. Uh, so he should be a grown-up and fucking grab himself by the shirt and go, hey, man, do the fucking show. But, uh, you know, fucking real life has interfered. My head's all scrambled up. And then uh, and I want to do justice to this. Uh, even though it's, it's just a fun trip. <laughs> it's not like I didn't, I didn't come over here to negotiate the release of hostages or anything like that. Although maybe I should. Maybe, oh, maybe they'll call me into fucking uh, action. I, I'm waiting for Obama right now to tap through on this fucking phone. Hold on, if that rings, you're going to know it's him. Uh... No, I'm, I'm here having fun. I'm here at the, as a guest of Ahmad and uh, Alawadi. Ahmad, Al, uh, uh, wait, Ahamad, that's his name. I, I found out that the H, remember I told you that he said he had a seven in his name? I should tell you this. Ahmad explained that the seven is is like the, I don't know, I, look, I'm not going to pretend that I know what he talked about, but apparently the seven has is pronounced like, ah. the H is not pronounced like, it, the H is actually pronounced ah, even in a word. So like if you were to, like, you know how we have hamburgers? with hamburgers okay but then say you have like ghost here it would be ghost ghost i don't know ghost is that it because he's ahamad that's how you say his name uh i'm doing a lot of questioning about pronunciation i'm doing a lot of questioning about a lot of things like I'm, i'm in the fucking car and i'm like and and it's i'm learning about people and i'm learning about cultures and I'm learning this. I, if I can give you one, let me give you one overview completely right now as an American in the Middle East, as an American in Kuwait, as an American not allowed in Saudi Arabia, as an American who should not even look to the, to the East and see Iraq, as a man who Iran is monitoring as he walks the streets here, uh, I will tell you this. Uh, these, this fucking, these people aren't different at all. They're not different from Americans at all. And maybe I'm prejudiced because of who I've met and who I'm running with, and these are younger people. But Ahmad's 26. All of his friends are like 26, 27. And uh, you know what they want? They want to just be happy. They want to live their lives. They want to they wanna go out and have a good time and eat with their friends. And, and fucking, you know, Ahmad likes wrestling. And uh, his friend Khalid likes MMA. And he likes fucking heavy metal. And it's... These people are exactly the same as us. Like I've, I've, I've taken some videos and I'll put them up on Facebook because I'm woefully behind in that. But I, I, I close one of them. I filmed at a courtyard in a bazaar. I'll get to that in a fucking few minutes. I went to a bazaar. That's right. I went to a goddamn bazaar. See, I should just tell the story linearly, but I cannot do that. I'm not a linear guy. Uh, I, I want to tell it linearly. Certainly I do. Perhaps I'll double it back. You know what? Let's just forget everything I said. Let's start from the beginning. Fuck no. I did that already eight fucking times. God damn it. Uh, I also, by the way, I'm swearing a lot in this hotel room when I picture some poor Muslim dude next door sleeping and just going, ah, I did, wh- what is this? Who is this swearing a host in my head? I don't know who that voice is. Um, I'm a swearing a host. I like being that. So uh, let's start with the flight out. Well, uh, I'll get, to, well, fuck it. I'll, I'm, because this show is going to be broken up in a couple of different, I'll do another show next week. I'm not going to cover all of it because I'm still here. Fuck. I mean, there's going to be more to talk about. So I'm trying to think of an arbitrary ending point. And I never do that, right? right? And that guy, I just fucking talk. And I figure I'll talk till I'm done. But then this time I'm like, well, I better lock and load exactly where I'm going to stop. And I, oh, dude, I thought myself into a fucking bubble this morning and last night. I just thought, and yesterday during the day, I was going to fucking record during the day yesterday. And I couldn't, I sat, I tried, I sat, I fucking tried. And then I'm like, well, go ahead and post some stuff on Facebook. And then I'm like, well, that'll just give you even less to talk about. Dude, I got my fucking skull. And I know you don't, nobody wants to hear that. Right. Or do you, you, you do maybe <sighs> fuck. This is see this is the again the problem with not having a script and not and, and I've done a ton of shit. There's a bunch of fucking stuff to talk about, but instead I'm going to sit here and tell you about how I don't want to fucking talk about it or I couldn't talk about it or I just didn't know how to talk about it. God damn it, talk. I flew here. I flew to the Middle East. Um our friend Erica, who is a friend of the show, picked me up and she she took me to the airport and I you know I was worried, man. I won't lie. I was on Emirates and oh, and dude, this is this sucks. I don't know if I talked about it last week. Emirates sent me an email and they're like, "Hey, uh, if you want to bump up to business class, it's only 150 bucks. Now, I was worried about a 16-hour flight sitting up in one position the entire fucking time, especially crammed into a goddamn plane. So I immediately stampeded to try to get over there and get the business class. Fucking gone. Already sold out. I was like, fuck, that pisses me off. But 
No problem. I was, and again, like I said, I'm shocked that the flight from LA to Dubai was was a straight fucking shot. I mean, that's 16 hours in the air. I just, I just didn't think that you would have that much fuel. It just seems ridiculous. But then you see these planes, dude. I get into the airport. First of all, uh, I'm, you know, I'm flying LAX, and I have to fly to the international terminal. And uh, I've been in the international terminal only one other time, and that was to pick up my um, my buddy Pat's wife, Pilar. Um, I was, and you know, I showed up there, and and had to wait and wait and wait and you just saw people walking through with their you know they have 12 bags and they're all covered in plastic which i think is to prevent you know uh, zika virus mosquitoes from climbing into their fucking luggage i don't know but everybody takes these precautions with their bags and so i didn't know what the fuck i was supposed to do i'm just gonna fly like a normal dude i will tell you this i brought a giant suitcase because i brought dude i brought fucking like 15 shirts and, and four pairs of shorts and two pairs of jeans. And, and how about if I tell you more things in numbers? Fucking idiot. 15 pairs of socks, 15 pairs of underwear. Because I'm like, in my head, I'm like, well, it's going to be super sweaty there. And uh, and I, I need to have chain, clothes to change into. And I will tell you this. I, I've just worn normal clothes. Because when you're out, you know, you're not out for that long. I only had a couple of really sweaty days. I mean, I, um, <laughs> you don't even give a fuck about this. But... We we went out a couple of times walking and it was super. I mean, it's been oppressively hot the whole time. Every time you look at, I look at uh, Ahmad's dashboard and his Mercedes. Yes, he has a Mercedes that he doesn't give a fuck about. That's the weirdest thing. Again, th- these dudes here are so laid back. Nobody's upset. Nobody's worried about anything. Ahmad and I, like this is like the second day. We go for juice. This country is obsessed with smoothies. Uh, they call them juice, but I mean, we're you know they're smoothies by us, and it's just they have different kinds. They put Snickers in them. They put fucking. Oreos in them. It's like they took a blizzard, but they melted it enough where it's liquid. Does that make sense? It's like milk, ice, Snickers bars, and and ice cream, and then they grind it the fuck up, and they it, it, they call it juice. <laughs> so uh, Ahmad is like, you got to have this juice. They have a juice called Heartbreak Juice, which is I, it's called, it's called like Ghana Mawad Amarada. I don't fucking know the name, but it was awesome. It was just like a bunch of different fruits, and it's all mixed up in a smoothie. Um, and then they had a bubble drink. He brought me for a bubble drink, which is, I, and I was worried because, you know, when I was in New York a couple of weeks ago, I had bubble, it wasn't bubble tea. It was like, it was almost like fucking, it was in Chinatown. So it was like horchata, but with bubbles in it. Fuck. I don't know. It was those, it was those tapioca bubbles. And I had them added to my drink. I'm like, Ooh, I'll have a mango thing with like bubbles. And, uh, I got sick in Chinatown. I had to actually sit because it was like eating fucking piles of sugar. You don't even think about it. I'm just chewing the motherfuckers and swallowing them. And the next thing you know, I got a sugar dump. My head is fucking spinning. I got to put my head down and have my shoulders rubbed and relax for fucking uh, a week and a half um, before I can get up and walk around Chinatown. So I I was hesitant to get the bubble drink here, but then Ahmad is like, oh no, you got to get it. So it's it's like seven up and raspberry juice. And then they put these bubbles in the bottom of the bubble. The bubbles are different. They're not made of fucking thick tapioca. They're made of, uh, you bite them, they, I don't know, they're truly bubbles. Like you pop them and there's mango and grape and fucking cherry. I don't know. I don't know how they do things here. They're magical. Fuck these people. Uh, <laughs> and, they're, and they're magical beverage making skills. Oh my God, they can't be topped. And I, you know, I'll tell you what, if it was this fucking hot, I would absolutely experiment with as many different beverages as I possibly could. Hey, fuck, it's hot. What if we invented mango bubbles to put in the bottom of our Cokes? Fantastic. Let's do it. <laughs> um, I don't know, I spin off into that, fuck Oh, when you look at the dashboard on, on Ahmad's uh, car Oh, and so, fuck, we went to get the juice And we're sitting there in the Mercedes And uh, and I will tell you this, there's all these little shops uh, I mean, they're not even They're like, you know how you go to a, like In New York, you got those little fucking stands in every corner Where they're selling uh, coffee or tea Like right outside Union Station Or not like a hot dog cart But it's an enclosed thing with a dude in it Well, these are just storefronts You know, there's no there's nowhere to sit you, it, um, ah, I tell you what, it's like dry cleaning joints in the, in the in America. You know how you walk into the dry cleaning joint and there's just a fucking counter and you pay for your stuff? Well, imagine that, but if it was a food place. Like Little Caesars. You ever go to Little Caesars and just that counter? I guess we have these in America, too. I guess I shouldn't be that fascinated. But there's a million of them here. And they all sell, like, kebabs or, or fucking, you know, sandwiches or drinks or, or, or laundry. They have all those different places. Um, and I, oh, I told you I brought so many fucking clothes here. So I, uh, I was trying to figure out if, what I was going to do. I asked Ahmad if there was a way I could do laundry. And he's like, yeah, well, there's plenty of, you know, they haven't do the laundry at the hotel. I said, dude, I, I did that once in fucking Fresno, California. And it cost me like 80 bucks to do a fucking load of laundry. He's like, well, I mean, I'm sure it's not going to be that big a deal. And plus you're saving money on other stuff. So you should go ahead and, and, and get the laundry done. And, uh, it's because to them, it's matter of fact, like they, you know why? Cause they all have fucking money. They have tons of cash and it's because there's. 
this this because uh, they, they do well and they work they work jobs or they make good money and then everything here is fucking cheap. Like I, I think these sandwiches. Like we went and bought fucking. We were at the bazaar and and we bought a bag of samosas, which was just snacks, and it was like two fucking full bags of snacks. It was a buck twenty five. Jesus Christ. Uh, I could live here. I'd be a panhandler, but I could live here. So uh, we're in the in the juice joint. And we're waiting to get juice. And the guy goes in to make our order. And we ordered heartbreak juice. And he brought it out. And I was like, this is really good. And next to us, there was a fucking, like a Denali. You know, like a, a big fucking Yukon SUV thing. And uh, as we get our juice, this guy, we, we get it. And the, the worker goes back into the storefront. Because they'd come right out to you. You don't even have to go in. I, I, should, I guess that's the, the difference. Like, it, like you talk about dry cleaners and Little Caesars and shit like that in America. Well, you still got to get it to your car and go to the counter. And get your stuff. Well, here you just pull up and you honk and a dude walks out. It's like car service, like from the 50s. So like Marsha from Happy Days comes out on roller skates and she's like, hey, you want a kebab? Certainly I do, Marsha. Thank you. Uh, it's, yeah, like th- those fucking, so, but it's it's not really a Marsha. It's more of a, a, a Maharsha, Mar- Marsha Ha. It's a dude named Marsha Ha. And he comes out and he takes your order. Uh, and they're all sullen. I, I should get into that. Re- I'll get into that in a few minutes. Well, fuck it. I'll just do it. Well, well, I'll talk about when he picked me up. Fuck. See, this is the thing. I, I have so much that I want to tell you, and I should tell you in order. So in my head, I'm like, should I tell it in order? But then you know me. I spin the fuck around, and we wind up in different places. And you don't care, and nobody cares. And who's this for? His fucking friends? I'm giving a fucking beat by beat about how I, I This is how I talk about things. Um. So this Denali is next to us, and we're drinking juice. And the Denali pulls out, and all of a sudden, boom, he fucking hits the car. He hits the Mercedes because he's backing out to the right and the nose of his car just hits the fucking back quarter panel wheel well of the Mercedes. And Ahmad looks at me and I go, that dude just hit you. And he goes, really? And so I turn around and the fucking Denali just goes to pull away. So I get out of the car because I'm, I'm going to go, hey, dude, what the fuck? And go up to him and grab his keys and go, you're not going anywhere. We're going to call an insurance guy and we're going to have because there's an accident. This dude in the Denali just... Hit his Mercedes. Now, look, I've been in a bunch of car accidents over the past fucking two years. And uh, and I must say, I've never been in a high, as high class of one as I was this day when the Denali hit the Mercedes. That was beautiful. But this fucking dude backs up in his Denali, and I go to get out of the car because Ahmad's not moving. And I get out, and the guy just drives off. And I look at the wheel. Well, and there's a big scratch. Like, right, you know, the guy fucking, he took it. He didn't dent it, but he took a huge fucking swipe out of the back quarter panel of the Mercedes. So I look at Ahmad and I go, dude, that guy just hit you. And he's like, yeah. And I go, well, what, I, so are we going after him? He just fucking hit and ran. He goes, well, I'm kind of surprised he left. I go, yeah, me too. So are we going after him? And he goes, nah, as long as the car runs, I'm happy. And I, I again, like I said, laid back and and they just, he doesn't care. Like he's the coolest guy. And I, and so, which makes me wonder why the fuck he even listens to me. Because, well, I will tell you this. He told me that as a younger guy, he was me. Like he was just, he gets fucking rageful and angry and he was furious. Um, but then he listened, uh, you know, he's grown up now and, and he's, I, I guess he's grown up at 26. I'm 49. <laughs> God damn it. Uh, so he's a dude who's, who's, you know, got a handle on things, but he, he just goes, yeah, as long as the car runs, I don't care. He goes, but that was kind of rude that he drove off. I'm like, yeah, fuck yeah, it was rude. Let's go get him. Like, that's how stupid I am. I want to go chase the fucking guy down. I want to sideswipe his Denali into a goddamn pile of rubble. Because, and believe me, there's enough rubble around here to do it. This entire fucking country, I, I just, it's the weirdest thing because they've, they've, there are, there are huge skyscrapers and, and I, I ate dinner in the Al Tahaji Tower. I'll tell you about that in a few. I, I, and I might be getting the name of that wrong. The Al, Al Tahaji, I think, Tower. Um, but they're building all these skyscrapers and they're building all these modern buildings. And yet there's these buildings from like the 40s that are still standing. Uh, that nobody lives in and nobody's nobody does anything with. And I, I asked the mod, like, what what's going on with those? He goes, well, people own them. And I said, well, what are they going to do with them? He goes, I don't know. They just don't sell them, and then they just sit there and they're on, and nobody tears them down. Nobody, there's no upkeep on them. There's no maintenance people because I, I asked because you know literally you will see skyscrapers and then there's rubble a fucking half a block away, and uh, or these dilapidated shacks. And and I so I said to him, I go, this is it. Just seems odd to me that they're not. It's it's like they're building without they're they're without rebuilding. Does that make sense? Like they're just putting up all of this fucking fancy stuff. It's like what was that movie Up? I think where they wouldn't the dude wouldn't sell his house and they built the fucking city around it. 
that's what it's like here, man. I mean, you've got fucking skyscrapers, and then right next to it, there's some fucking mom and pop furniture store with all these different. I, I even said to Ahmad, I go, dude, there's no way that you could get in there and buy anything. And he goes, well, it's a very old place. And I said, well, yeah, but I mean, how the fuck does that guy make money? He's got an empty storefront except for two couches. Does he sell it? Does he not sell it? What does he rent? Does he let people sit down in there and relax? Is that what he's paying? And he just goes, I don't know. Uh, but, you know, and because that's another thing. He doesn't need to know. Like, they don't, he, I, uh, Ahmad has said, I don't know to me so many times. I, he's lived here, you know, he's, he grew up here. He went to college in, in America. Uh, he went to University of Colorado at Boulder. And by the way, I'm giving a lot of facts about Ahmad. I don't know if he said, thinks that's okay. But, uh, but, but, you know, he went to America. And, and so he's, I guess I expect this to be, you know, this trip to be a crazy different land and and it's certainly there's a different culture and stuff but these people are very americanized you know I, I i came here thinking that i was going to be this out of place fish out of water guy and i wouldn't know how to react and i like i said i asked him out a million questions can i make eye contact with a woman in a burqa uh you know at, what about when i'm at the pool at the at the hotel can i look at a, a woman and say hello is that possible you know is, i don't want to be a, a jerk um do i have to look at the guy first and, and nod at him before i can go ahead and look at his, his wife and smile i mean I, you know, it's just because i'm trying to be pleasant and polite to everybody because also i i guess i thought that i'd be perceived as some weird threat when i was here because we've been told in america that the middle east hates us i had talked to other people about kuwait and they said dude kuwait's like america junior don't even worry about it you're going to be fine there I guess I just wasn't as prepared uh, as I should be for the fact that it is, it truly is America Jr. Um, I flew in, like I said, I, I got on the flight to Dubai from Los Angeles. I'm in the international terminal and, uh, and you know, in the front, which is where I waited for Pilar, it, it, because it's after the customs and things like that. So it's just the front and there's a bunch of people there. But then when you get back into the actual terminal, you know, you have to, I had to check my bag and uh, this was pretty cool. I checked in with Emirates is the flight, uh, the people, the, the airline, I should say. So I checked in my luggage and, uh, they said, okay, here's this, this ticket is, this ticket gets you to Dubai. This ticket gets you from Dubai to, uh, Kuwait. And then here's a voucher for when you land in Dubai, you can use this for breakfast at any of these restaurants for free, which was pretty fucking cool because they recognize, I guess, that you're traveling for 24 fucking hours. So they go ahead and buy a dinner in addition to feeding you on the plane. So I took those and then I had to go and get into the international, uh, the, I, I was really worried because I, you know, I'm TSA pre, so you can just breeze to the front of the line, but I'm like, fuck, I haven't waited in security line in a really long time. Uh, so I went there and it was not the zoo I thought it would be, but it was still pretty busy. And then there, uh, you know, but it's the same thing, belts and shoes. And I, as I, I guess, again, like I thought, going international, they're going to make me give blood. They're going to look at my passport 12 times, give me the fish eye and, and make me see the fucking preamble of the Constitution. I mean, I didn't know what the fuck was going to happen, but it was fine. It was just you just breezed right through it. You waited, of course, because there's a waiting to get through security, but uh, it, it was fine. And then I got into the international terminal, and this is the, the thing that was really surprising to me. Uh, I, you know, I've been in a million airports, and they have shops, they'll like fucking uh, restaurants, and Wolfgang Puck, and you know, all these fucking chilies sit down restaurants. Some places have fancier restaurants where they're like, oh, you know, you can go ahead and sit down at a, at a uh, uh, like Rick Bayless's joint in Chicago. But, uh, I was truly unprepared for what happens in the international terminal, folks. I, I walked in, and I, I I don't know if it's just international people are shopping before they leave. I, you know, there's duty-free shops. And then there was, uh, I, I, the first store I saw was Gucci, okay, in, in the airport. I'm like, who the fuck is buying Gucci in the airport? And then I turn, and there's a fucking Dior, and a Fred Siegel, and a fucking Bulgari, and a Coach, and a Burberry, and a, and a Victoria's Secret, which that, that cracked me up. I don't know who the fuck is in the airport going, oh man, I totally need a fucking thong for this 16-hour flight. You know what? I need a couple of thongs. I'm going to fucking change the entire time. I got to look as sexy as possible for the next 16 hours crammed in next to some guy who's mouth-breathing all over me while we try to fucking sleep as we fly the sun around. Fuck. Uh, but, but Victoria's Secret and Burberry and Coach and Yves Saint Laurent, I mean, these are all, and they're in the Los Angeles airport. These are the people, I, I guess it's people are landing there and then, and grabbing stuff or duty free. They're buying it as they head out of, out of the country. I don't know if, cause again, I'm used to American airport where it's just, you know, barefoot slobs eating McDonald's and fucking, you know, trying to get into the A-line three numbers ahead of you for Southwest. 
but in in the international terminal, it's just these well dressed people who are shopping at Bulgari and buying fucking tiaras. Who the f- I don't know who the fuck needs a tiara for a flight, but apparently the entire comp- country of Malaysia does. That's who it is because you would see these groups of Asians and these groups of people just and. You know, I've seen that at, like, Disneyland. You see a lot of Asian tourists, and, of course, they flock together because that's how those people work. It They get, I don't know if that's true, but they have a fucking, they all have shock collars on it. They wander fucking more than six feet away from one another. It just goes off. <laughs> ah, 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 ah. Uh, that was my imitation of an Asian yelling. Hi, I'm racist. Um, oh, by the way, there's racism here. I should tell you that. Here in Kuwait, I was shocked. Uh, I, I was, uh, I guess I wasn't shocked. I, I thought you know, the entire Middle East would band together against me because I'm an American person. And they'd be like, ah, who the fuck is this dude? Boo. Yeah. Hey, hey, Joe, go home and eat your hot dog. I don't know who that is. I don't know who that Asian guy in the Middle East who hates me is, but that's him. So, uh, so I, I've come here. No, I to say there's racism here. There was no racism against me. Like I have not experienced any prejudice, uh, any prejudice, I should say. Um, but I did hear, uh, there was an Asian guy, like at a stoplight, we were walking, and another guy kind of pointed at him and said, Chinko. And in my head, I was like, fucking Chinko, that's... And in my head, I thought, well, is he is he calling him a Chinko, or, or was there a game that I missed, like Plinko in the window that I walked past and did not notice? Perhaps that was what it was, I don't know. But, uh... But I actually mentioned it to Ahmad. I go, they called him... That, that dude got called Chinko, and he, and he just started laughing, and he's like, yeah, that happens here. And, uh, you know, this country, there's the Kuwaitis in it, and it's a rich country. I mean, I guess they've got the second highest per capita income. I don't know what it was. Ahmad was quoting me numbers, and my eyes glazed over. But they they have all these Kuwaitis who who live here and do stuff, but then they have this weird labor force of Indians and Pakistanis who, uh, who come here and do all the 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 shitty work um like we went into the gas station and uh they have gas station attendants here still uh so you just pull up and you you know you roll your window down you're like assalamu alaikum and then they fill the car up with fucking rocket fuel because like it's 98 grade gas 99 grade gas which is crazy but it's these indian dudes and when we first got off the plane you know i i was gonna fucking tell things in order but uh we went to a grocery store because i wanted to have water in my room so, and also, I won't lie, I wanted to see the fucking grocery store, because you know me, I'm a weirdo. I like American grocery stores. I go up and down each fucking aisle. Well, I wanted, I truly wanted to see what the fucking grocery store in Kuwait looked like. So as we were driving, Ahmad found this out-of-the-way joint, and it looked bombed out. It didn't look like there was any, because there was no bustle, no hustle, nobody in the parking lot, just an Indian guy barefoot sitting down on his phone. Which, by the way, that's the weirdest contrast, too, out here. There, there are guys who are wearing work clothes from the American 50s. Just those drab olive slacks and these button shirts with, like, those sleeves rolled up. And they're filthy dirty. And they're wearing... Everybody wears sandals in this country. Everybody wears sandals and Crocs. I, I don't think I've seen a sock other than in my own fucking suitcase. It's horrible. Because not only do they wear the sandals and the Crocs, but then... They go to bus stops, they go to restaurants, they go anywhere and they, and they fucking, they take their shoes off and they put their bare feet up on the seat next to themselves in a restaurant, dude. I mean, we went to a restaurant to eat and these, these chic dudes. And I, 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 by the way, I've learned this too. You know, they have the outfit, the fucking, uh, it's called a dishdasha. That's that white thing that goes egg length. And then it's got a, you know, they wear the chic hat with the flowing, uh, red cloth on their head and the black thing. Um, I thought all those dudes were sheiks. Uh, no, that's how everybody fucking dresses over here. Unless they're Indians and Pakistanis who are pumping your fucking gas, and then they dress like uh, Mr. Wilson from the Dennis the Menace show in the fifties. They all dress like they, they dress like the the guys from Mad Men if they had been beaten up and left in an alley for dead, because all of their clothes are just fucking dirty and fucking hanging off them. But their button shirts and their slacks, you know, there's not. I haven't seen a lot of jeans in this country. I actually asked Ahmad. I go, do they have jeans? He goes, yeah, they sell them in the malls. I go, but does anybody wear them? And he's like, no, it's too hot. Ahmad himself exists in sweatpants. Which is the weirdest fucking thing? Because I'll tell you what, I brought, I brought a couple of nice button shirts here, and I brought, like I said, a couple of pair of jeans. And uh, <clears throat> Ahmad has not worn anything with a zipper the entire time I've been here. He just wears sweatpants and sandals. And I said to him, I go, dude, I go, come on, man, are you serious? I go, wear a sock, wear a fucking shoe, do something. And he laughs because he's heard the fucking show, so he knows how I am. And he goes, dude, I'm telling you that everybody here wears sweatpants. Everyone, you're gonna see it unless they wear the dish dasha. They're all wearing sweatpants. And he wasn't kidding. All these Kuwaiti dudes, all of his friends and stuff, they just. They dress for comfort. 
and uh, and they wear sandals and they don't wear socks and and I and uh, you know I haven't done a lot of staring at his or his friend's feet, but I mean I I can't help but notice feet when I'm in these establishments and I'm at bus stops and I'm in uh, all these different places and guys take their fucking sandals off and they put their shoes up and. Uh, Man, there there are not a lot of pedicures in this country. Holy God, I think you would clean up if you opened a pedicure joint here for a spa, for a salon, or something for dudes, and you offered to take care of it, and you could convince them to do it, and just you know get one guy in the door. That's all you got to do. Get one of these fucking weird goat foot cloven hoof motherfuckers in the door and fix their feet up and shine them up, give them the buff treatment, and they'll be like, wow, check this out, and they'll show their other cheeky friends, and those dudes will come by and get their fucking shoes thrown into a rock tumbler and buffed up, or their feet, I should say, not even their fucking shoes, throw their fucking feet into a rock tumbler because that's what it looks like. You ever see, remember that when you were a kid, you had that rock tumbler that would polish gemstones? They should just jam these guys' feet in there because it is just, I thought, like Jim Carrey from Dumb and Dumber would look at this and go, holy fuck, what happened to your feet? I mean, it it is just terrible. Fucking Lloyd Christmas feet all over the goddamn country. And then they, and the thing is, they're not afraid to show it. They they wear the sandals and the and the Crocs. And I, I think it's because, you know, they, they don't ever take them off unless they're in a fucking restaurant eating their food. So then their nails grow around the sandals and hold them on in some sort of weird, like, uh, living cage. Oh, it's awful. It's just... It is just a nasty barefoot croc fucking wearing sandal extravaganza country. And I'm not a fan of it because they put their bare feet up on chairs. Uh, man, I, I see. I am all over the fucking joint. I wanted to tell this stuff in order. Uh, how did I start out? Oh, I was talking about racism in this country. I heard the guy called Chinko. Um, but yeah, but then these Egyptians and these, these Pakistanis and these Indians... You know, they come here and they do the hard labor. And every time Ahmad and I are out driving, we see these people on the road working. They're, they're road crews. You know, they got the orange cones just like everybody else in the signs that say slow. But you pull up and these fucking guys, I, I told Ahmad, I go, I, I don't understand these road crews. I go, they, they all look like they're all wearing their parents' clothes and trying to play grown-up and fix the street. And he just started laughing because they just look so sad. They do. There's no, nothing official. There's no uniform. They're all wearing, like I said, those mismatched fucking slacks and button shirts. And then they have an orange vest over it. All of them have an orange vest over it, but it doesn't fucking matter because they have these hard hats that are too big and that are falling in front of their eyes. And they're all holding signs that say slow, but they don't know what they're fixing. There's dudes just sitting on the street. Like I said, this at that grocery store, when that barefoot dude was sitting there going through his phone, because that's the thing, there's poverty with those dudes, the Indians and the Pakistanis. And I was like, dude, these guys are just so broke and miserable. You can see it in their face. He goes, yeah, they do. But that's generally their resting face. I said, what? He said, misery is the resting face of the Indian and the Pakistani. And, uh, and I go, that, that makes complete sense because why wouldn't you be miserable? And I said, but they've just got to be so horrible, like thinking that they're here and they're, they're, they're fixing stuff and they're, and they're sweeping the street. I mean, everywhere we go, they're, they're sweeping the street, the street. And, uh, I said, do Kuwaitis do any of these jobs? He said, no. He goes, these guys come and do it. And, uh, I said, but they've got to be fucking miserable. Like where do they live? And he goes, oh, well, they're, cause there's these, like I said, there's these huge skyscrapers, these amazing I call them chic houses. There are, there are three-story houses, and they're all over the place. There's some that are abandoned. There are some that are just chic houses that the chics aren't using because they're in fucking France for the summer. But then, you know, Ahmad told me he's firmly middle class in this country. And I saw his house. Holy fuck. It's a goddamn palace. I mean, I, I took a photo of it. I'm going to put it online. I don't know if he wants me to, but it's... We pulled in because he was just going to go get a couple of bottles of water. Boy, I'm all over the place on this. But fuck, whatever. He he pulled in to get a couple of bottles of water. And when it came out, his sister came out with a friend. And, uh, and they went to walk to the car. And I stood out there waiting because I was going to say hello. And Ahmad came out, held up the bottles of water, and he got in the car. And so I'm kind of standing outside. He goes, hey, are we going? And I, I got in and I go, all right. I go, is that, who, who are these women? He goes, well, one of them is my sister and one of them is her friend. I said, and you're not going to introduce me to your sister? He goes, no. He goes, we don't do that here. I said, what do you mean? He goes, we don't, we don't do that here. It's just, it's, uh, it doesn't make any sense. They, they don't, um, they don't find it. It's not comforting. He didn't say those words. He didn't say it didn't make any sense. He didn't say it's not comforting. I'm, it didn't make sense to me. Uh, but he said that women don't want to meet a strange guy. It's just a weird thing to be. And I go, well, don't, I mean, she knows I'm your friend and stuff. And he goes, no, they don't. He goes, I, and he said, you know what? My friends don't even know my, my sisters. Uh, it's just not done here. You know, you don't introduce your sisters to your friends. Nobody's all hanging out together. And, and so that, that 
kind of stuff started to assert itself a little bit when I heard that, and that you know, because that's so different. You know, in, in in America, we all know one another and you introduce people and that's what you do. But uh, here he just, he was very adamant that he's like, no man, no, it's, it's, and it's it, to them. It's not weird. He's like, no, it's not weird. It's just, you know, none of my friends know my sisters. And I'm like, that's kind of fucking weird. Actually seems pretty bananas to me. Um, but you know what? Fuck that. Fuck me for even thinking that it's not bananas. It's not wrong. That's the thing. It's different. I always say over, I said over here, it's the same, but different. And if their culture is to not introduce me to their sister or to a woman or she's not comfortable talking to another man, then that's not fucking bananas. That's just different. And that's the thing I have to keep telling myself. You know, I came over here with an open mind. I'm, I knew I'd have to do things a little differently. I, I knew I couldn't just go talking to people. But at the same time, I'm still me. So I wound up still going out and talking to people and being myself, which is great. But I, I mean, I <laughs> that we were in the mall. I, again, I'm I'm really... I need to rein myself in here because I it's I feel as if there's so many things I want to talk about and I don't have discipline. I wind up vomiting things out out of order and then I know that I want to talk about them later and then I'll bring them up and I wind up repeating them. I need I need to fucking rein myself in here. So let's rein ourselves in. Let's gra- let's take a breath and let's uh let's go into some specifics really quickly. And because uh, I figured, and I told myself if I went in order, it would be easier to keep track. But my head does not work in that way. But I'm going to force it to, and that's one of the reasons why I was having so many problems starting the show. As I mean, how are, where are we in? Fuck, we're only Jesus. We're just over a half hour in, and I, I don't, I don't think I've said anything cogent yet. I mean, I, in my opinion, I haven't told any sort of uh, linear story. There's no plot line. It's just like fuck. This is weird and amazing. Uh, it's this strange, overwhelming feeling of, uh, of input and then trying to share it with you. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to be this vessel who tells you, I'm trying to tell all of you what Kuwait is like. And some of you have been there. I mean, I've had people write me. They've been here for uh, either some of my comedian friends have been here for USO tours and some army people have come here for army stuff. Uh, some people came over here to meet a mod sister. What the fuck, man? How do you not introduce her to me, you dick? <laughs> all of a sudden, all my friends know her, but I can't talk to Miriam. I just said her name. That's probably bad. I'm sure it's against the culture and I'm sure an imam is going to kick in the door. Uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to do this. I'm going to reboot here. I'm going to stop, not stop. I'm just going to, I'm going to start and try to tell this in a linear fashion from the time I left Los Angeles. And, and then I'll get to, uh, I'll get to talking. Okay. How's that sound? Because I feel like I'm just kind of I'm machine gunning a bunch of fucking points with no real depth to them. I'm just like, this happened, and then this happened. I feel like a fucking five-year-old. Mom, check this out. And then and then it was weird, and that guy looked at me. Ah, shut the fuck up, dude. Tell a story. Be honest. Be truthful. And, and also, be fucking composed and disciplined and get something out that, mean, that makes sense. I left Los Angeles. <laughs> and I flew on, uh, on Emirates Airlines. And like I said, it was a 16 hour flight, which was shocking to me. So I got into the terminal. They had all those fancy joints there where they're selling Burberry and fucking Gucci and Bulgari. I don't even know what the fuck Bulgari is. I thought that was a Korean stew or like a fucking grill, but apparently it's something fancy. And, and, and the thing is those shops didn't just exist. There were people in there buying things. There were people buying Gucci. There were people buying Victoria's Secret, which fucking cracked me up. Um, I, again, I just love the idea of someone going, man, I need the fanciest bra in the world for this flight. Uh, so, um, oh, and the terminal's gigantic. So I'm walking, but I will tell you this. So I looked at the map because I was hungry. I hadn't eaten and it said, uh, you know, normally these fucking joints LA now they're trying again, like I said, all these restaurants are, are starting to come into airports, you know, in Chicago, they got Bayless's joint and in Texas, they got some fancy places. So these usually they're now kind of trying to put in good places to eat. So I figured, well, fuck, they got Bulgari and they got fucking, uh, Burberry and coach and Gucci and Victoria's secret, which is by the way, where I wanted to eat. Uh, cause I would much rather eat pussy than candy, as you know. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I happened to see under restaurants, there was a place called ink sack. And, uh, I've talked about ink sack on the show here before ink is a, a fancy restaurant in Los Angeles opened by Mike, Mike Voltaggio, who was our chef on top chef. And then he opened ink sack, which is a sandwich place, just a couple of doors down. And now he's got a second location in Hollywood and they're just really good sub sandwiches. 
uh, you know, they, they're just four inch sandwiches, but they've got amazing tuna and he's got a cold fried chicken sandwich and he's got a, like one named after Jose Andres, who's a famous chef called the Godfather. They're, they're just amazing sandwiches. So I was like, fuck, if Ink Sack is here, I can actually buy one to eat here and then one to possibly bring on the plane. Cause I was so, dude, I was so worried about the 16 hour flight because again, I, I, I'm not good. Uh, I mean, you can see I'm bouncing off the fucking walls just telling you these stories. I couldn't imagine sitting in one place for 16 hours. But then at the same time, I'm also the kind of guy who absolutely could sit in one place for 16 hours and never fucking move. It's it's bananas. Uh, you know, I should be up and moving around and stuff, but I can I can very easily just sink into a fucking chair for 24 hours because I'm that guy who's just staring straight ahead, contemplating why his life is ruined. Um, but not ruined, but just different. It's different, but the same. <laughs> my life, my life is the same as before, but different. Uh, it's the same, but different as you know. So I said, I'm going to go to Inkset and get a couple of sandwiches and, uh, I would eat a tuna in the airport and then I would bring a cold fried chicken for the flight because cold fried chicken is already cold and it's not going to go bad on a fucking 16 hour flight. But again, I was worried about, I, I don't know what I was worried about. It was like when I first drove to Vegas for the first time, I'm like, fuck, I don't know if I can make this drive. It's four hours. And then you make it and you go, fuck, that was easy as hell. I mean, because you can stop whenever you want. I mean, a plane, you can't exactly stop whenever you want. You can't go pull over. Hey, pull over. I got to stretch, but you can get up and take a lap through the fucking plane. Um, and I had no idea the size of the plane, but I, I mean, I, I already tipped it a little bit earlier. Jesus Christ, biggest fucking plane in the world. I'll talk about it in a second. So I went to Inksack and, uh, <laughs> it was so this is so dumb for me to expect this. I guess I expected chefs and like white linen, but it was just the dudes at the airport, you know, the fucking Haitian dudes and the Mexican dudes who can't get jobs anywhere else. So they went up working at a goddamn fucking sandwich joint in the airport. They're like the Indians and the Pakistanis in this country sweeping the fucking street. But instead of street sweeping, these guys are making my sandwich. So I order a tuna sandwich and I order a chicken, uh, cold fried chicken. And the guy uh, at the counter who had trouble with English, uh, I said cold fried chicken. He's like, oh, okay, so a uh, chicken salad. I go, no, no, uh, cold fried chicken. Oh, okay, so it's no problem. Eh? So do you want a a, a, a a chips? And I said, yes, I want these crab chips because they had like Old Bay seasoning. And he rings it up. Now, I should tell you this again. Like I said, fancy. Now, it's an airport. So prices are going to be a little bananas anyway. I got to stop saying fucking bananas. Uh, prices are crazy at the airport. But ink sack is also a little expensive. But for my tuna sandwich and my cold fried chicken sandwich and my bag of crab chips, it was 18 bucks. That's right. Two sandwiches and a bag of chips for $18. But that's how fucking, you know, it's good. So that's why you do it. So he gives me a little, uh, one of those buzzer things. Those, uh, it's like a vibrator, but it's square. Basically, they, they gave me a square dildo. And when it buzzed, I was going to go get my fucking sandwiches and grab them. So I'm sitting there waiting. And, uh, you know, it wasn't particularly busy. I mean, the, the terminal was, but Ink Sack wasn't. There was like one other person who placed an order and... I'm waiting and uh, I'm looking and I'm waiting and I'm looking and uh, this dude is still at the counter and, and there's one chef and by chef, I mean one Haitian dude in an apron. He's not really moving or jumping into fucking action when my receipt goes back there. And I don't know if he's got other sandwiches to make or if he's waiting for the chicken to get fucking plucked or the tuna to get made into salad. I don't fucking know, but they're just standing there. I mean, nobody's doing anything and I'm sitting there looking cause I can see them. There's a countertop that's kind of high, but I can see their hats. I should tell you this and I can see their hats are not moving. So there would, you would think they'd be moving down some sort of sandwich line and creating a sandwich, but no, they're just, their hats are just static. They're not going anywhere. And, uh, so I, after about five minutes, I got up and I peeked and it turns out the Haitian dude is just talking to another dude. He's in the back talking and they're, they're jabbering and they're going back and forth and they're having a fun time of discussing sandwiches or salads or life or whatever the fuck. And, uh, finally the counter dude comes back and I go, Hey, is this, is, is my order in? He goes, Oh yeah, it'll be just a few more minutes. Once what, you hold, I gave you the, uh, the, the buzzer, right? And I said, yes. And he goes, okay, when it buzzes, it'll light up and then you are done. I go, well, I understand that, but it doesn't look like, I mean, it was just, it's just two sandwiches. Yes. But when it buzzes and lights up, you are done. Like literally wants nothing to do with me. So I go back and sit down. And, uh, and normally I'm not this guy, but I'm timing it. I'm looking at my fucking phone. I'm, I'm, and it took nine minutes, nine minutes for to make two sub sandwiches <laughs> and a fucking bag of chips. So it goes off. The dildo starts buzzing. And uh, of course I put it on my crotch just to get that extra little boost before my flight. I walk up to the counter and, uh, he's like, Oh, okay. And he walks over and he goes, so we have a Godfather and, uh, we have a, uh, uh, me, and he's got a sandwich bag. It's got five sandwiches in it. 
And I look at him and I go, nope, that's not me. And he goes, no, no, he's number 65. And I go, I am I have the receipt right here. It's number 65. He goes, yes, this is number 65. I go, no, it isn't. Uh, I only ordered two sandwiches and a, and a thing of chips. And he grabs my receipt and he looks at it. He's like, oh, hmm. And it's, it's, he starts staring at it for like 20 seconds. Oh, and he's looking at the bag in his hand. And he's looking at the receipt. He's looking at the bag in his hand. And he's looking at the receipt. And the Haitian dude is still having another conversation with another guy. And I, by the way, I don't know where these fucking five sandwiches got materialized. I don't know who made them because those guys didn't move an inch. And all of a sudden they just fucking snap their fingers like the great gazoo and boom, there's a bag full of fucking sandwiches to give out wrong. Uh, so I, I looked at the guy, I go, that's not it. He goes, oh, oh, well, hold, hold on. Uh, and he goes in the back and he goes to the Haitian guy and they start having a long in-depth discussion about these sandwiches they pull them out and then they start unwrapping them and looking at them and in my head i'm like if they if they think about because i'm watching them now i'm, I'm not sitting down i'm watch, not watching hacks be static i'm watching these dudes talk and mill around uh and meanwhile you know there are people of all nationalities wandering around this terminal buying fancy things and i'm the one who gets stuck with a fucking guy who can't make a goddamn sandwich order correct i'm looking I mean, you know, you got to think Victoria's Secret and Bulgari and Burberry, they're, they're waiting on their customer's hand and foot and making sure they're happy, right? I got two dudes having a conversation about five bags of sandwiches and a fucking third dude just poking his head in. He hasn't even worked there. The other guys are wearing uniforms. He's wearing like a full-on white uniform. I don't know where the fuck he worked, but he popped in for a conference, a sandwich conference. Uh, so they start unwrapping the sandwiches in my head. I'm like, if they give me those unwrapped sandwiches, I'm going to be pissed. So they start looking, he moves and he puts them over to the side and the Mexican guy goes, oh, well, I, all right. And he doesn't say anything to me, but they leap in together to start like kind of making sandwiches really fast. And uh, I, I see, and I see him when he's doing it. The Mexican guy throws on, you know, two rubber gloves or whatever the, f- the God damn it. That was weird. It's a weird hiccup in the middle of everything. He, uh, he goes to make another sandwich really fast for me. And I'm watching them make it, and I see it's, and I know, I know it's going to be fucking terrible. But I, I let them make it, and he wraps it all up, and he puts it in the middle. He goes, all right, sir, here is your sandwich. And he gives them to me. And I go and sit down, and I, uh, I unwrap them and look at them. And again, I look. I recognize the fact that I'm, I'm probably being a pest here. But I unwrap the chicken sandwich. And it's supposed to have like, you know, a, a big piece of fried chicken on it and pickles and sriracha and a, a creamy mayo and fucking and lettuce. And I, I want to put a picture up of it just so you can see the difference of what it's supposed to look like and what I got. I open it up. There's I, there's like a beak. There's not even a piece of chicken. It's like a beak with a, a one stripe of sriracha, three pieces of lettuce and uh and no pickles like he doesn't even put the pickles on it because he was making it super quick and trying to hand it to me and i open up the f- i so i open that sa- and then i open the tuna sandwich there's no it's not like a pile of tuna it's just this it's almost like they took a knife and they spread tuna on it rather than putting it on with like a scooper so there's a a, a substantial amount and i i uh, i've now been there for like 13 minutes i'm analyzing shit it, it and i go to the counter i go dude i don't want these he goes, no, it's number 65. And I go, yes, I know. I'm number 65. I don't want these. And he goes, well, no, but it was wrong before, but we, we corrected. I go, it's not wrong. It, it's not right. It's all wrong. All wrong. Is there a manager? Oh, yes, hold on. <laughs> he goes off and he disappears. He leaves the restaurant at the kiosk, whatever the fuck it is, because it's food court. And he goes around the corner and I don't, I don't know where he's going. He just, he like leaves the actual kiosk and bails. And uh, as I'm standing there, another guy walks up with like a sack of sandwiches and he's got two of them in his hand. And I look at him and I go, they fuck yours up too. And, uh, you know, I'm forgetting that there are polite human beings in society who don't swear. And so the guy actually flinches. Like when I said it, he's like, <laughs> and he looks at me and I go, I'm sorry, did they, did they mess up your order? And he was German. And he's like, yes, uh, the order is incorrect. I don't know who the fuck that guy is, but I can't do a German accent. So, but that's probably one of the reasons why I was like, when he, they fuck your order up too, because I look mad again, I'm. I'm 6'2", 285, and I'm standing there fucking pissed, and the guy, well, they fuck your order up too? I got to learn how to talk. Uh, but the German guy was just like, yes, the order is all wrong. Uh, that's a French guy. And then, sure enough, counter guy comes back, and he brings a manager with uh, that he found from, I don't know where the fuck she was. But she walks up, and she's like, uh, what's the problem? And I, I just went, look, these sandwiches are terrible. She goes, I'm really sorry. And she just gave the money back. There was not even an, She said, I'm really sorry, which was nice, but there was no well, we can remake them or Jesus, that's awful. Or just, it was, it was business as usual at the airport ink sack. And she just refunded my money. And, uh, and then, uh, she's like, would well, you want to return the chips? To- I, I want to return everything. I don't want anything from you people. <laughs> it was so bad. 
Uh, and now then and then in my head I'm like, oh man, I'm gonna starve on this flight. <laughs> I can't believe I'm gonna get on this plane and fucking starve now. Uh, I needed that sandwich. God damn it, I was gonna eat that sandwich over Singapore. Uh, so I walk over. I go to get on the plane, and I was sh- I tell you this man, I'm walking, and all these women keep walking past me in this this costume. Like they're they're all wearing the same uniform. They got these hats with these scarves on them and these fucking really tight. Uh, and when I say tight, not like tight fitting. I mean like really sharp, fucking attendance uniforms. And I thought they had to be like Singapore Airlines because they were also there. And a lot of these women were Asian looking. But then I get to the Emirates gate, and it turns out they're the Emirates waitresses, the sky waitresses. And I'm gonna, you know, fuck that sky goddesses because their uniforms were fucking amazing. And uh, and then they get them all together to, to brief them. It was pretty cool. Like they were I, that that moment where they get all of them together to go, hey, look, these animals are about to get in this fucking plane. Make sure everybody gets an orange. You know what I mean? Where they, they kind of just steal themselves against the coming masses who are about to come in and team all over the plane. Uh, and I took a photo of that because uh, they just, they looked like a group of secret agents. They got together in their meeting and they're talking, they got their scarves and their hats and they're briefing each other. And it just, it looked like they were going to get together and go and assassinate Matt Helm. It was fantastic. <laughs> they just, just sharp as hell and in a fucking formation. It looked really good. So, uh, and I got to tell you, I didn't, I didn't know anything about Emirates at all. You know, when I first looked to fly, I thought I'd have to fly from LA to New York and all, but no, it's fucking, it's a straight shot to Dubai. And then they got their shit together. They got boarding zones. And they start announcing first class people can go on and then the business class people can go on. And then they got guys who come out with paddle signs. Um, you know, you ever see those guys that get a tennis tournament who hold up a thing that says out? That's, that's actually incorrect. That never happens. That's the line judge. Um, I guess it's cricket or whatever the fuck. I don't know. Dudes who hold up signs that are like, you know, they, <laughs> you ever see a guy with a sign? Why does it have to be a cricket game or some bullshit? You ever see a dude holding a sign that looks like a ping pong paddle that has a word on it? Well, that's what they did is they sent these dudes out. He had a B, a C, and a D and to stand where your zone was. We start getting on the plane. And then when you get through, you can actually see through the fucking glass, the size of the plane. And all you see is this engine, this gigantic engine in your face. And it, you, can, you can barely see the tail. It's huge, man. It's an, a, a 380, I think it's called, an uh, Airbus 380, an Airbus, which is a terrible name. Because when you get in, it is so not a bus. I mean, in addition to the glamorous wait staff that were there, the sky goddesses of Emirates, there's a... Uh, there's the uh, there's a first class suite when you walk through that's got it, it, these these cubicles that you sit in with a bar. It's fucking amazing, and I of course was not in that. But as I start rolling back, it doesn't matter because the entire plane was nice, and I think I was in like sixty two k. But I get to the back and I'm sitting there, and uh, you know people are still getting on the plane, and people are still getting on the plane, but nobody's sitting next to me, nobody's sitting next to me, nobody's sitting next to me, and holy fuck, dudes, nobody sat next to me. I, I'm, I'm on my, I, I, which is gorgeous because in my head, I'm like, fuck, how am I going to sleep on this plane? How am I going to move? What am I going to do if I'm crammed in with people? And sure enough, I fucking, I sat there and nobody, I get to row to myself or row to myself for 16 hours. Oh, gorgeous. Uh, they, they walk around, they hand out fucking refreshing towels before the flight even starts. Uh, and, and they're checking on all of us to make sure we're okay. And there's uh, there's in-flight Wi-Fi, but I, I should tell you, the Wi-Fi was really spotty. It didn't fucking work really well. They kept telling us there would be Wi-Fi, but then they had a circle and a slash over the phone most of the time. For the first, like, four hours of the flight, there was no Wi-Fi. So I sat there listening to fucking uh, old-time radio shows. That's 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 truly who I am as a guy. That's, that's every fucking second of 49-year-old Mike Schmidt. He's in the air listening to goddamn Dragnet while he's on this fucking unbelievably glamorous plane with people walking with gold laced fucking vests asking if they can get me a cocktail. Uh, but, but we took off and, uh, you know, they had, they had a bunch of TV channels. They got a bunch of movies and this made me laugh because, you know, there's the women in front of me were African. Okay. I could, their accents, you could kind of tell. And, uh, the one girl was watching the middle do you know that fucking show with fucking uh, the dude from Scrubs and, and Patricia Heaton, I think, and then a bunch of nondescript kids, and I think one of them might have been from Malcolm. But I'm watching, and she's watching the season. Like she, I, I would, I kept waking, I would wake up because I would close my eyes as I'm listening to my stuff, and I'd look, and uh, I'd try to get on my Wi-Fi, and then I'd close my eyes and I'd look, and over her, over my shoulder, I could see she she watched the entire season six or whatever the fuck it was box set of the middle. She just kept the middle wouldn't go away, and I, in my head I'm just like, if I, I thought I was going to ever escape the middle, it would be on Emirates. 
airlines in the air on the way to Kuwait. Nope, I was still firmly entrenched in the goddamn middle. She's watching that, and I'm just thinking, who the fuck would ever... I, I don't watch that on land. I mean, if you're on a plane, maybe if it's the only channel you have, you go, fuck yeah, I'll watch the middle. But I think she brought them. I think they were DVDs that she actually had. I don't know if they were bootleg in America or in Africa, or she bought them. Maybe they were, that's what they were selling at Bulgogi. Maybe Bulagi, that's what it is, or Bulogi, or whatever the fuck. Maybe Bulgogi, or... Bul- no, Bulgogi's the Korean food. Bul- Bulagi, or Bulagi? Fuck, I don't know. Bulgari, there you go. Maybe they were selling the fucking middle. Maybe that's what that joint is, because I never went in there. So maybe it was just Bulgari is like... Like a, a, a fucking Slovakian word for shitty TV shows. I should have popped in there and bought something. Uh, but she's watching the middle. And I, I kept, like I said, listening to podcasts, trying to get online. And then I couldn't. And then finally I went, well, you know what? I'm going to fucking, I'm going to sleep. But then they started to bring out dinner, which was amazing to me. They brought out fucking dinner. Uh, you know, and I knew they were going to feed us, but I guess I didn't think they were going to feed us this much. They brought me a fucking, because I haven't eaten on a plane in fucking forever. You know, it's that thing where you get on American Airlines now and they're like, hey, do you like Chex Mix? Great. We've got four pieces of rice Chex for $40. You want to pick that up? No, thank you. I'm going to pass. Hey, you guys like Pringles? We do. Well, here's a Pringle. It's $4. Fuck off. Uh, So they bring dinner and it was... They asked me if I wanted the, you know, there was fish and I'm not going to eat the fish on the fucking plane because I watched airplane. I'm not, I don't, I didn't have a fucking sword to commit seppuku on the fucking plane. So I'm like, nah, eh, I'm going to go ahead and pass on the fish. Uh, I went and got the chicken. They had pesto chicken and a marinara penne, which seems like one sauce too many, if you ask me. And, uh, but then it had like a juice and a dessert and a, and a I, I mean, it was a really, it was a dinner. It was real food. And I, I ate what I could because it's still, even though it's good airplane food, it still has that metallic taste. Like it was pesto chicken in a marinara penne cooked in aluminum. You know what I mean? Where they, or there's like radium in it or something. It tasted, it had that hint of, well, you know, we've just, we had to throw in a touch of barium to give you an enema in the middle of the 16 hour flight to make sure you're all loosened up. I mean, it was just that sort of weird chemically. And maybe that's just me because folks, I think I'm a super taster or perhaps I am. I don't know. I don't want to brag. Uh, actually, that's all I want to do is brag. But uh, after dinner, I said, fuck this. I waited. I, read, I listened to a podcast and I just, I go, I'm going to sleep because I couldn't get on Wi-Fi. And I laid down, I lay, I, you know, I lifted up all the arms and I laid across the seat and, uh, and I slept. I slept for like five hours, man. I didn't think I would, but I, I mean, I can sleep anywhere. Can, and on a plane, I can just close my eyes and sleep for three hours and just lean against the thing. But I thought laying down, it would be a problem. Dude, I didn't even move. Now that was a problem because when I woke up after five hours, uh, my shoulder was completely out of place. Like I woke up and my arm was twisted and it was all fucked up. So I'm like, Oh dude, that's no good. Uh, so I had to stretch that, get up and stretch a little bit. And I was also worried, again, like I said, when I worried about that four-hour Vegas thing, I'm like, what if I got to go to the bathroom while I'm driving? Oh, man, I'm going to have to fucking pull over in the desert. And uh, it turns out I've got a, the bladder of a camel, so it's never a problem. But on the plane, you know, I, I, I didn't have to, I thought I'd have to use the restroom, and I'm like, oh, my God, it's a small joint, and what if I, you know, what if something happens? And uh, you, you always warn yourself about terrible things, and then it winds up nothing is bad, uh, you know, well, relatively bad. <laughs> I didn't have to shit on the plane. I guess there you go. Because if I had, that would have been terrifying. I couldn't even imagine it because it's, you walk in there and it's so tiny. Uh, I can barely stand in that place, let alone have a fucking seat. And, and who wants to sit? I, I can't even, dude, I, I couldn't even imagine. If I had to shit on an airplane, I would hope it crashed before I got out. I would do something. I would push a button to make sure that we went down just so I didn't get blamed for anything. I didn't want it to have, have, have it to happen. God damn it. Uh so I slept and then I went out and I stayed awake and I tried to go online. I was able to go online with my phone, but not so much with my laptop for some reason. I don't know if it was just two devices couldn't connect. And because uh, I really wanted to to learn the GoPro and the camera that, that our friend Chuck had sent us. And uh, I'll be honest with you, there, I, I did not learn them. I mean, I, I wanted to watch the YouTube video they gave me and I watched it and I tried to do it, put it together and something's wrong with my brain, man. I need Adderall or something. I really, I, I've been told it before, but I, I don't focus very well. I mean, case in point, the first fucking 35 minutes of this show or whatever the fuck. Um, and it's only getting worse. Like I find myself scrambling all over and, and, uh, and, and I don't know, you know, and I've even telling you about it. I find myself spinning off, but, and I don't mind it. I like it sometimes. And I like being able to do it sometimes, but it's, it's becoming an issue when I, I could do things and then I don't. And it's one of the things I talk about with Shannon all the time where I'm like, I, I know what I'm supposed to do. I just don't do it. And I, I wind up getting distracted and doing other things. And case in point, starting the show over and over because I wanted to make it good. I wanted it to be great. I wanted it to be something that I could be proud of. And then sure enough, we get 35 minutes of me talking in circles and then telling you, hey, I, be, I need to stop, <laughs> which is, 
uh, which is not great, you know. But that's that's hey, here that's what we got in Kuwait. That's what we've got. You've got me talking in circles and hating myself. Um, you know, because real life gets in your fucking head and you spend time thinking and you stare and you wonder and uh, who cares? But then you you go. Like, I actually, I actually talked myself out of doing this where I'm like, ah, oh, man, nobody wants to hear this. And that's like, what the fuck does that mean? What, they, I'm only here because somebody wanted to hear this. I'm, I'm in Kuwait because somebody likes me talking and wanted me to come here and they wanted to meet me and experience their life. It's great. It's fucking phenomenal. But I don't ever underestimate what happens when you're alone. You can fucking talk yourself out of anything. So I'm on the plane at, uh, and it went well. The flight was fucking perfect. I mean, I, I, it was 16 hours and it was completely uneventful because there was fucking nobody next to me. We land in Dubai. I got a six-hour layover in Dubai. That's a little rough. Uh, we land in Dubai. It's like 2.40 in the morning. It's 98 degrees outside or 95, I think. 95 degrees outside. I mean, crazy hot. And it's that thing where, you know, you're on this air-conditioned plane, but then when you get off, you walk into the jetway, and you just get hit with that blast in your face. I used to sleep as a kid. I think I talked about this with my face on the heat vent. Um my mom wasn't thrilled about it, but I would do it. She'd be like, get away from there. What the fuck are you doing? Get away from there. But I would have my face on the heat vent and just let the, and I, cause I like hot air. I like heat. And so it didn't bother me at all, but you walked in and it was like, whoa, it's just this complete change. And again, like I said, two thirty in the fucking morning. So I walked around the Dubai airport and, uh, I, I gotta tell you, it was, it was a marvel. I mean, it was, it had to be you know, three floors, four floors of marble and, you know, giving away Mercedes. And it was a completely different world, obviously, because, you know, when I left America, I was in the international terminal, whether there were expensive shops and stuff, it didn't, there were still, you know, a lot of international travelers, but there were still a lot of American faces. Uh, I, I wound up getting into the airport in Dubai and I was, I was the only American face. And I, I started getting looks in the airport. It was pretty interesting because I would I stopped into some of the duty free shops and I looked at stuff because I wanted to find uh, stuff to bring for a mod or just, I, or just you know anything to buy. And they had like ketchup flavored Pringles. Like I, I was that's, you know me. I, I wanted to see all the neat weird stuff that they have. I walked in. They had a, a pile of hookahs, which and then they had a bunch of coffee pots and. Uh, all the stuff that you would think you would find at some sort of Middle Eastern flea market. You know what I mean? Just these, but I mean, with, in a fancy setting. And then they have, they had seeds and nuts for sale for snacking. And, and, but the Dubai airport had palm trees inside and these, these floor to ceiling windows. It was really an unbelievably beautiful place for an airport. It's beautiful, but for any place, I mean, it was kind of beautiful. And I walked, I went and got, uh, I, I got, you know, they gave you the breakfast slip and there was a McDonald's. And in my head, I was like, wouldn't it be funny to get a McDonald's? I'm like, if you get fucking McDonald's, jump off a cliff. I didn't want to eat it. I thought it would be funny to get it just to take photos of it. But then I'm like, dude, don't fucking do that. Don't waste your fucking free coupon. Go to fucking Shwarmaville or whatever the fuck they got. So they had like sh- uh, sh- Shwarmanji or <laughs> some fucking place. And I got chicken shawarma with a sauce and a little fucking biryani rice or basmati rice and, and chowed that down, which was great. And then I went to my gate. And uh, like I said, I'm, I'm pretty much the only American face and I'm, I'm getting some looks, but nothing bad. Just a curiosity. I sit down uh, after I walk up and down the airport. I read all about there. There's a big wall with some pictures of the of the emirs of Dubai. And they've decided that they want to be in the forefront of the world aviation. They've decided. And I thought to myself, you know, maybe tap the brakes a little bit, Dubai. Seriously, <laughs> go ahead. Try to figure out a way to get grass to grow in your country before you start thinking about taking over the world aviation-wise. Because uh, you looked outside and it was just this barren wasteland. I mean, it, it just, it looked like, f- I was waiting for there to be two suns and to see Luke shooting w- w- swamp rats or whatever the fuck. Uh, I was waiting for Jawas to come and steal R2-D2. You know, it was it was that sort of fucking barren landscape. And... uh but, I mean, it was really impressive, the display. And it, the best part is they had an Amir, and he's, like, in his flight suit with his chic hat on. And he's like, ha-ha, ah, thumbs up. And he's, I guess he's an aviator, so he wanted to build the world's best airport. Now they're building another airport. But, but again, they have, all they have is one skyline. They don't have anything in Dubai except airports and the tallest building in the world, apparently. Um, so I, but, but, again, incredibly impressive. I get to my gate. Uh, I kill the time in the airport. They had showers. I, in my head, I actually anticipated take, I wanted to take a shower. Uh, and then they had a crescent and I thought that would be cause they had prayer rooms and stuff. So I was in the airport and call to prayer went off, which is amazing. Um, it's just, it's call to prayer and they do it five times a day. And then if you are religious, 
you go to the prayer room and you put your prayer mat down or you pray there in the in the prayer room slash mosque, mini mosque, I guess. Uh, but I will tell you this. Again, we've been told when call to prayer happens, everything stops. In America, we just assume that the whole fucking country hits their knees and faces Mecca and they pray for you know this five minutes or ten minutes or however long it takes and they do it five times a day and that's who they are. Well, that's not the case at all. I mean, call the prayer goes up in the airport and there were some people who were annoyed because it woke them up. Like they, you could see them. They got up and they looked at each other and they were kind of bummed. Uh, but the, you know, certainly there were some people who went to the male prayer room and I actually followed them. I went, I went to the male prayer room and I wanted to go in and take photos. And then I thought to myself, you know, uh, that's probably not a good idea. I would imagine going into their place of worship and just snap, especially big white guy. Hey, look at the big white American taking photos of us as we pray. I mean, that just doesn't seem like something that would be working out for anybody on any level. Uh, and also I should say, I get to the door of the prayer room and I saw everybody taking their shoes off and I went, eh, fuck it. I don't need to go in there. Uh, not only because I don't need to see a bunch of dude feet, but also I don't want to take my own fucking shoes off. I'm that guy. You know me. I don't want to be barefoot ever. I, I barely want to be barefoot in the shower or the pool. Uh, so I did not go into the prayer room, but called the prayer echoed throughout the entire airport. And it's, it's amazing. I, I, I have to tell you, I, I, we should have something like that in America, but I don't know, just at, at like five times a day, they should just, well, no, cause they'd probably play fucking God bless America or some bullshit like that. You know, I mean, although I guess if it's Ray Charles's version, I guess we just, uh, nah, cause I hate a baseball game and they play God bless America. I don't. It just doesn't make any sense. It's not me against God. I'm not being against America. I just don't understand why you're playing it at a fucking baseball game. Play Roll Out the Barrel or some bullshit like that. Give me a seventh inning song that I can care about. You know, we were in Houston. What did they play? They had, uh, that was, you know, the, they played Deep in the Heart of Texas. That, you know, I just hit the microphone. Uh, the stars at night are big and bright. Yeah, play that, man. Don't play fucking God Bless America at a baseball game. But so if we did a call to prayer, it would probably be that nonsense that they would do or some just have Ode to Joy. You know what? Let's do that. Can we make that? I, I, although Beethoven's not American, right? He's German. Wolfgang? Yeah, it seems German. Um, but if you played Ode to Joy five times a day to convince people that they had to go do something, and not even pray. Like, they just had to stop and pause. I love the idea of call to prayer. Five times a day they play it, and these guys go pray. In America, just play Ode to Joy five different times and let people just fucking look around and contemplate how good things are or how great they are or how happy they are or how much better they could be or just something. This, this moment of reflection, this time to contemplate. Although I guess we're an entire fucking nation of navel gazers anyway, so we don't need an excuse to fucking sit there and go, ooh, I wonder how things could be different. But at least there'd be a Beethoven soundtrack five times a fucking day. You, you know, if you're depressed in your car, wouldn't you be a lot better if you heard Beethoven tell you to be depressed in your car? I can be depressed on my own, but fuck, if Beethoven tells me to be depressed, that kind of changes it a little bit. I'm on board with that. So call to prayer happens. I think about taking photos. I'm walking around. I go, my, my shawarma I I'm, I'm looking. I'm reading all the school that they had in the airport, which was neat. But I was starting to get a little beat, kind of tired. So I actually finally found my gate because my gate wasn't open. Finally, they opened it about an hour before the flight. So I went and sat down. And there was an, uh, there was an Arab family there. And the woman was in, a, uh, she was in a hijab. And her husband was there. But he was wearing like a soccer jersey. And they had four very rambunctious kids. Uh, you know, check that. Three um, restless kids. And then one kid who apparently had somehow found an Adderall vending machine because he was doing fucking cartwheels, this kid. And the best part is his dad is trying to control him, okay? Like, his, you know, the mom is, she keeps doing that thing where she's like, no, come, come. And she's patting like the chair next to her, come, come, to make him sit down like a fucking puppy. But he was having none of it. He's just kind of running in circles and he's doing that thing with his, his lips that, you know, the fucking, I can't even do it there you go he's doing that noise he's running and he's he's pushing things off of tables like there was a, a somebody had a bottle of water there and he just walked up and he shoved it off the table and then his dad kind of grabbed him by the arm and he socked his fucking dad now this kid's probably five maybe four probably five could be six might have been 15 no he was, he was i think he was five but he was that little kid who just he, his dad picked him up and he punched his dad in the chest. Like he punched him in the thigh when he grabbed his arm and he ran into his dad with his head, like headbutted him like that kid in parenthood. And, and his dad finally like kind of shook him by the arm. And I'm like, Jesus Christ, am I going to watch infanticide here in the fucking, uh, I mean, I, I didn't know what they were doing, but it, what was funny is when the kid was fighting back by punching and headbutting in my head, I was like, well, maybe that's how he gets treated at home. Maybe the dad fucking tosses him the fuck around. So this is how they do it. Like he, they, they stand up for one another or he fucking bashes in. So he hits him back or he's teaching him to be tough. I don't fucking know. 
But, uh, but the kid was rampaging all over the place. Now, I should tell you, the, the woman in the head job is one seat away from me. She's on my right, two seats down. The seat in between us, I have my computer bag on it. And then there's an empty table next to me. Now, you know, I usually do that. I put my bag in the seat next to me until it fills up. And then, of course, I put it on the floor and anybody who wants the seat can get it. So she's trying to control the kid. The dad's trying to control the kid. He's running around. And finally, she pulls out a bag of potato chips. And this was weird. They were kettle chips, like kettle brand chips, which we have in America. And I didn't think they had them anywhere else, but they have them here. Well, what the fuck? How do I know? How do I know where kettle fucking markets their stuff? But it was kind of surprising to me to see kettle brand chips in, in Dubai. And uh, she takes out this little bag of chips and she kind of shakes it like, sh- sh- like, <laughs> like, hey, j- go, here, boy, here, boy. Look, look what I got. Look what I got. And he sees it and he calms down and he walks over really slowly like, what's going on here? How am I getting chips at 7.30 in the morning? That doesn't make any sense at all. You can see he's kind of skeptical about the whole thing, but she holds the chips out and he reaches for them. She's like, ah, and she pats the seat. So like if he wants the chips, he has to sit next to her on her seat. And he looks and he makes a face and she goes, ah, and she holds the chips out and she pats the seat again and he won't climb into the chair with her. So I see this happening and I take my computer bag off of the chair next to me and it, I, this kid might have been five, but inside he might have been 60 because he, he just identified immediately what I was doing. And he looked at me and he smiled and he just kind of nodded like, yeah, that's right. And then he climbs up in that chair and then she gives him the chips. So uh, she opens them for him and he's just doing that little kid like, <laughs> like he was... He was so little kid, like no pretense at all. He was not behaving. He was smashing his head into his dad. He was looking at me and nodded. He sat in the seat. You know, I better give me that seat. God damn it. And he's eating these chips with his, you know, (laughs) and I looked at him and I smiled and he smiled at me and, uh, I looked back down at my phone and I hear him and he goes, because his mouth is full of fucking chips. And I didn't look up. And then, uh, he scooches over. I can see him out of the corner of my eye because it's a big seat and he's a little kid. He scooches over closer to me than to his mom. And he says, where are you going? And uh, I look over at him because I realize he's talking to me. I said, excuse me? He goes, where are you going? And, uh, I, you know, his, his dad starts to laugh because his dad's like across the way on another seat. The mom is just like, no, no, no. And she's, she's patting her seat to try to get him to slide back over. But he's looking right at me. He's like, chewing chips, mouth open. Where are you going? And so I looked at him and I go, I'm going to Kuwait. And he does this little kid face, like uh, where he just kind of like looks and furrows his brow, confused. And he's got a potato chip in one hand, the bag in the other. He closes both of his eyes really tight, but he's still looking at me. He's facing me. And he says, but you're white. <laughs> like, like it just, to him, it made no sense at all that a white person would ever be going to Kuwait. He had no, I mean, he was probably shocked that I was white. I don't know where he sees many of us. I don't have any idea, but it was so perfect. He just, where are you going? Why are you going? Well, I'm going to Kuwait. Beat. But you're white. And, uh, and I just started to laugh and I go, yeah, I, I, I am white. Thanks for pointing that out. And his mom is like, no, 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 no. Sorry, sorry, sorry. No, 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 no. Sorry, sorry. I go, it's okay. No, it's no problem. And she like grabs him and slides him over and he runs away and his dad grabs him and, uh, and then they wrestle over chips the rest of the time. But it was like fucking perfect, but you're white. So they get the guys out with the fucking paddle signs. They have us get in line to get on BCD zones and we fucking board the plane. Now the Airbus 380 was gigantic. I think it might have had two floors. Like there might have been people sitting, all the first class people were upstairs and then we were downstairs, but it was still a giant roomy plane. Uh, The flight from Dubai to Kuwait, not nearly as roomy. How unroomy was it? Well, I can tell you this. When we got on the plane, the actual plane that was heading from uh, Dubai to Kuwait was parked inside of an Airbus. That's how little room we had. Uh, They had actually pulled it inside of the Airbus to keep it warm and then we fucking took off from the outside of it. Uh, it was just a small, I mean, almost, almost smaller than an American plane. I mean, if, if I'm being honest and I've, uh, why wouldn't I be? Of course I'm being honest. Uh, I had a window seat on this plane, but it was packed. I get in 
And uh, and again, I'm the only white dude on the plane. The, the, some of the waitresses are kind of they're German or European, but I'm I'm the only like American. And all these again, as I've, I've told you before, I don't know how anybody travels without earbuds. I don't know how anybody travels without a phone. But the guy who sat next to me was just he was a, a Muslim guy, and he sat down with his sandals, and he was. Like he had nothing. He had no entertainment. He had no ear. And they, the good thing is they give you out. They give out earphones so you can plug them in and listen to the fucking whatever the TV is that they have. But he sat next to me and I apologized to him. I go, look, I'm a big guy. I'm sorry. And he doesn't know English. Oh, this way. <laughs> he had no idea. Um, but then a little kid, not a kid, probably like a 17 year old kid, sits next to him on the aisle. So this kid's jittery. He's kind of jumpy. And uh, his family is elsewhere on the plane. And he keeps standing up to, like, look at his mom. And his mom would, like, wave and sit down, sit down. And he'd sit down. And then he'd look around and he'd get her antsy and he'd stand up again. And his mom would go, sit down, sit down. And I didn't know if he was just nervous about flying or if he was nervous about being away from his family. Or he may have been a little Kuwaiti slow, if you know what I'm talking about. Might, might, have had a, might have had a little Dubai dent in his head because he seemed to be doing a lot of looking around and not knowing where he was, and he seemed to be very unaware of his surroundings. He wasn't sure what was happening. So they start the plane, and we go to fly. Oh, I should tell you this. By the way, when I was on the fucking the Emirates flight, the first flight, the 16-hour flight, after I fell asleep, I woke up after five hours. And when I woke up, one of the sky goddesses comes up to me, and she's like, are you hungry? I said, I, I don't know. I, I, did I sleep through breakfast? She goes, oh, no, breakfast isn't until two, two hours before we land. But you slept through the pizza service. What? The pizza service? She goes, yes, you were asleep, so we did not stop. But we have vegetable pizzas or we have snacks. Would you like something? I go, I, I don't need a pizza, but yeah, if you got snacks. She goes, well, hold on. I'll see what I can find. She comes back. She brings me a fucking Kit Kat bar, a Milky Way bar, an apple, and two glasses of water. Like, just unsolicited. Just goes, here, I thought of you. you. I thought you might be hungry. Here. Oh, Emirates, sky goddesses. Uh, oh, and then I should tell you, breakfast on the plane, they, they came by and they're like, hey, what do you want? Uh, we have eggs and we have eggs with chives. We have an eggs and an omelet with baked beans and potatoes and all this shit. Or we have a vegetarian selection, which is uh, was a tikka masala or a curry, a ghana masala, whatever the fuck. I go, fuck that. I'm a dude. I'm, I'm a masala man. Masala me up. So they gave me masala, which is like a vegetable curry with some samosas and a croissant and a yogurt. And it was amazing. And I ate that. So, I mean, dude, I got two full meals on the plane plus a snack. Oh, and by the way, I took two bites of the apple, dropped it on the fucking floor. And had no idea where it went. It rolled under the the seat of the Africans and then just completely disappeared. So I I don't know if somebody picked it up or found it or where it went because I looked. I tried. I fished under it and I didn't want to grab an African ankle. So I'm like, well, fuck, I'll just let that apple go. That's a a loss I got to take. I got to take that L. Uh, but I assume they found the apple later on and I'm hoping they didn't trace it back to me through my bite marks. Cause again, these are fancy planes. It may have taken my bite marks through some laser when I got on it. So, uh, so I get in the second plane and like I said, they fed me breakfast, they fed me dinner. And then they gave me that voucher for shawarma when I got into the fucking airport. So then I get in this plane, they start walking around with more food. And this was, again, this is a, this was a plate of cold cuts with flatbread And then a yogurt and an orange juice and an apple juice and water. And and I ate it all. I shouldn't have, but I did. I fucking wolfed it. But it was good. It was like fucking ham and turkey. And I I was like, God damn. And this didn't taste chemically. If it had tasted chemically, you know I would have left it behind. But it was good, so I fucking ate it. Uh, And I ate it. And then the guy in the middle of me, he ate his food. But the kid on the end, he kept standing up and looking for his mom. Well, he didn't eat any of it. Uh, and then he kept standing up and looking. His mom's just waving at him. He's standing. Then his mom finally walks over, and she's like, eat. And he goes, oh, and he starts this talk in another language. I think he was Indian. And, and, uh, oh, and I mean, I'm not going to do an Indian accent because that's fucking rude. But uh, the mom was like, eat, eat. So she, she had him eat the cold cuts. And then he, but he had a yogurt. He had, he had all sorts of shit. And he didn't touch the rest. You know, there was uh, melon and fruit. But as long he, she made him eat the cold cuts. And then she went and sat back down. And it was the weirdest thing. She hovered over him while he ate the cold cuts. So she went and sat down. And we're flying and uh, we're cramped. And, and it's only like an hour and 40 minutes, I think it was, to, uh, from Dubai. But the problem was the, the flight itself, I think, is an hour. But we were on the, on the gang plank for 40 minutes and it was hot. Uh, you know, they got the air cranked up, but it doesn't matter because you're just fucking sitting there and the sun is beating through the thing. And they make you keep the shades up. I don't get this. And I guess it's because they don't want 
the flighted goddesses, they have to do that when you land. But they always tell you, they, when we landed, we had to put the shades up. And then when we were in the air, they had to put the shades down if we wanted. I, it's weird. So that was the rules. You had to put the shades up. So uh, so as we're coming in for the landing, we're, we're taxiing. Or I'm sorry, we taxied when we left. We were there, it was 40 minutes on the, on the runway trying to get a, a, a way out. And then we were able to, to fly. It was an hour. We're in the air. And like I said, they fed us. Boy, I'm jumbled all over this fucking thing. They fed us. And uh, so then we're coming in for the landing. And they're like, all right, you know, you got to open your shades and get ready. We're descending. Our, uh, our descent is happening now. And the kid, the, you know, they make you put your seatbelts on for the descent. So we're coming in and I, I look out and I can see, you know, uh, desert. You know, I'm looking out the window because normally when I fly, I don't look out the fucking window. I don't care. But as we're, we're fucking landing, I'm looking out and I'm seeing just everything that I've never seen before. It's desert and it's all parceled. And there'll be like a, all of a sudden there's like this body of water in the middle of nowhere. And you're like, what the fuck is that? And then I'm like, wait, is it a mirage? Am I seeing a mirage? Oh my God, I'm, I'm so excited. I'm like fucking Don Quixote or somebody. Did he see mirages? I have no idea. But they, they bring us in, we're descending and we're about to land in Kuwait and they give us the speech and they're where, and you know, that when you're landing, it seems like you're gaining speed, even though you're actually decelerating, it's because you're descending. And so you're, the pressure's changing and the plane is starting to shake. So this kid on the end, he keeps standing up and the, the sky goddess, one of them is in her belted in her seat and she's facing us. She's because we're about four rows from the middle of the bulkhead. Uh, so she keeps seeing him. He stands up and she's like, no, and she weighs at him and she makes him sit down. So he sits down. So then he goes to stand up again and she weighs. She's like, no, no, sit down. So he sits down and he puts his seatbelt on and he's looking at us and he's looking around and he looked back at his mom and his mom is just waving. Like, don't worry, we're going to land. And he looks back at his mom and his mom just waves and he looks at the sky goddess. She's like, sit down. So he puts his hand up in the air. Now he doesn't stand up. He raises his hand and the guy between me, you know, we don't speak the same language. The guy in the middle is, he, I don't know if he was Egyptian or what, but he did not speak English. So I look at him and he looks at me, but we spoke the universal language of what the fuck is going on with this screwball in the goddamn seat next to us? Because he kept standing up, sitting down, standing up, sitting down. They kept waving him down. He looked at his mom. He raised his hand in the air and nobody's doing anything about it. And we're descending and the plane is starting to lose pressure a little bit. And we're all just like, all right, the thing is shaking. There's a little bit of turbulence, but that's all right. We're heading down. We're about to get on a runway and we're going to fucking land. The kid puts his hand up again. The sky guy goddess looks and says, no, sit down. And she waves her hand down. So he leans forward and he just throws up all over the floor. I mean, he, he just, he tried because he was trying to get up to go use the restroom. Uh, I guess I didn't know it until he fucking yacked all, I mean, all over the floor. Just, I mean, it was so, I felt terrible for him because, you know, we're flying, he's landing. He's, and also there are no vomit bags on Emirates. Uh, if there had been one, you know, I would have given him one, but I started looking right away and he looked, he finally, he threw the headphones. He took the headphones out of their bag and he grabbed that and he just starts throwing up into that. He's thrown up all over the floor, all over himself. And now he's throwing up and dude, look, um, we all saw Stand By Me, and we've seen people throw up, and we know that that immediately makes us want to throw up. I mean, you, it just does, because the noise and seeing it and then the fucking smell, you know, nobody likes used ham. And if his mom hadn't made him eat the cold cuts, now I'm blaming her. I'm pissed at her, because I'm not mad at him, dude. Fuck that. This kid's sick. He tried four fucking times, five times, six times to stand up and go to the fucking bathroom, and they wouldn't let him, and he raised his hand. He's just being polite. He doesn't know any English. He doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know any better. He's looking at his mom. He's looking at the sky goddess, and he's following what the authority figures in his life are telling him, but he can't verbalize the fact that he's going to fucking throw up all over the goddamn place. So he just leans forward and lets it go. Boom. And, But I will say this. It was like he had no regard for where he he just threw it on, on himself like all over his pant legs and all over his shirt and uh, and uh, on the seat in front of him and I, and just he just let it go man um and i'm not saying you throw up in a neat orderly fashion i don't know where the fuck to put it but finally he he took the headphone bag and then the other guy and the guy next to him tried to give him his headphone bag and he threw up in that too but then he's holding them he's holding these bags of puke and then he goes to stand up we hit the runway all right, we finally land and we're still taxiing, taxiing to a stop and he goes to stand up and this time they sent like a dude, like a sky god to go get him and the guy, got, he goes, no, sit down. And I go, hey, and he looks at me and he goes, I go, this kid just threw up all over himself and he looks down because he was just telling him no before he even got there and then he looks down and he sees this kid is covered in sick, 
mean, it's all over the floor. It's all over the seat. And he just goes, oh, uh, okay. And he, and he leads him to the bathroom. The kid's carrying two bags of fucking vomit. And he goes into the fucking restroom. And, uh, and I'm sick. And the guy next to me is sick. And he's kind of like, I can see him. He's got his eyes closed and he's got his mouth covered. And I'm like, dude, if you fucking let go, that's going to be really bad news. Because you know what? On the first flight, I'm like, hey, man, I got to row to myself. You know why you want to row to yourself? Because you don't want some kid who doesn't speak English blowing fucking chow all over his goddamn shoes. And then the guy next to you smelling it and blowing chow all over your fucking shoes. I mean, that's, that's why it's optimal to get a seat to your fucking self on a goddamn plane. Uh, but this kid goes and uses the restroom. And then he, he comes out and he's... I think I would have cried. Like if I threw up everywhere, I think I would have I would have been pissed or something. I would have done something to try to save face. This kid just acted like, yeah, I throw up all the time. Like he was totally in stride. He sat and he sat back down in the puke seat, which is the fucking weirdest thing in the world to me. And he sat down and he waited us for for us to deplane. And uh, and I just wanted to get out of there. The guy next to me is like he's holding his stomach now and holding his face. And I'm like, don't you dare, don't you fucking dare unleash. But in the meantime, I tore open my headphones and I had the bag at the ready just in fucking case. In fucking case, Muslim Jones wants to go up ahead and throw up all over the place. I'm going to hand him this fucking bag. Uh, but luckily, he contained himself and it didn't turn into a thing. Um, so he didn't puke, but we had to walk out. So then I got to walk. I stepped on the fucking seat to get around the puke because I don't want, I don't want, I listen, you know me. I don't want, I don't want to be anywhere near it. So I get off the plane and now I'm in Kuwait. Now I've heard that there's a huge dash to go get your visa. Okay. You got to run. You got to, you got to rampage over because I heard the wait is at least 45 minutes. So I had told a mod when I was getting to town and I said, it'll be about a 45 minute wait to get a visa. I was going to dash over there. So, uh, I get into the airport and, uh, remember how I said the Dubai airport was a modern Marvel. The Kuwait airport is, uh, I wouldn't use the phrase modern Marvel. I would, you know what I would use the phrase? Not a modern, modern Marvel. You know what? I would actually use this phrase. The Kuwait airport is a fucking mess. Uh, it, 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 I will tell you this. It was, it was interesting to get off the plane and then I start walking. And that was when I was first introduced to the cologne cloud that hovers all over the country of Kuwait. Uh, everybody in the airport. I mean, you just walk past and it's all these guys who smell, smell like spice and musk and, and I found out later it's because these guys in the dish dasha, the, the, the dish, dish dashas, they, they spray cologne underneath them because then it prevents static cling from the clothes that they wear underneath the dish dasha. And uh, I think I said dish dasha. It's dish dasha. <laughs> so, I, but I, I didn't know why. All I knew is when I got off the plane, you, you just, you walked into a, a, a festival. It smelled like someone had decided to put on 45 street fairs in one building, all of different ethnicities, just that kind of contrasting cologne smell with a spice smell, with a smoke smell, with a food smell. That was just, I mean, it was, I'll tell you what, I, I don't even, I can't even imagine that kid getting off the plane, walking into that after he just threw He's lucky he was empty because when you walk into that airport and if you're, if you're at all a little queasy and all of those smells hit you, I mean, you just got a projectile vomit all over the goddamn place. Uh, but I thought it was awesome. I thought it was interesting. It was, it was like, you know, like walk, walking into a, I, I don't know, a, a lavender cave, but unfortunately everybody had their ball sack out. Like it, does that make sense? It was like perfumey, but also funky and also kind of nasty and, uh, but also good. <laughs> that was different. Uh, so you're, I'm walking to the airport and this is also where I was introduced to the dudes with their bare feet up on regular chairs. Uh, and the airport was completely packed, crazy crowded. I mean, and people carrying like cardboard boxes, people carrying garbage bags and, and, and then fancy people with like, like metal luggage, like crazy gold, gold line bags. And it was just a real melange of people. And I'm walking through and I, and I got to admit like this entire trip, I told Ahmad this, like I'll walk around and I'll, I'll just stare straight forward. Like I'm, I'm taking in a lot of the views, but then sometimes I'll just walk straight forward. Like, but like I, like I have a purpose and I told them I'd like to try to make people in town think that I'm a secret agent who's here and I have some sort of contract that I've got to fulfill. And I, you know, I'm an international assassin who's here to do some business, which is probably not the, the image you want to project in, a, in another country. That's just stupid. You want to be friendly and opening and, and, uh, and welcoming to people. But instead I walk around with like, sometimes I'll just, I'll have like a straight face and I'll just walk straight ahead and people look at me like, fuck, who's that dude? That guy's here to kill somebody. Uh, cause it's funny to me because that's weird. Uh, because I'm 49 and I can't fucking shake the fact that I'm also 11. 
So I'm walking through the airport, and I'm, I'm, but I'm walking with purpose. That's the thing is I wanted to get my visa. And I had Googled, there was this site, this guy, he was like, go here, go here, go behind this food court, and then you got to get in there, and you got to take a number right away before anything else. Take a number because then you've got to fill things out, and you know they'll be calling numbers while you're filling stuff out, and other people don't know the deal. He was like, he gave me all the secrets. Said it was going to be 45 minutes. So I made a dash and a turn and a move and a look. There's a couple of escalators. I avoided. I went through. There was a food court, but it was closed down. So I'm like, all right, where's this place? But then there's signs everywhere that say visa, visa, visa. Uh, and because, you know, again, I wasn't sure. Online, I checked. I said I would have to call. I thought I'd have to call the Kuwait embassy. And then they did more and more research. It was like their first website is like, oh, my God, you got to call the Kuwait embassy. You got to get approval from the U.S. government. And that's the first place you look. Then you start doing some research. You start realizing, well, no, it's not that draconian. I mean, you can get into the fucking country and you can do your visa when you get to Kuwait. And then it, it was said it was 140 bucks, but there was a 45 minute wait. So I was prepared for all that. Then this guy said that it wasn't $140 when I did some more research. He said it was just $35 because they have to make a copy of your passport. And that's where they'll charge you the 35 bucks. But they won't charge you the 140 so I didn't fucking know. All I know is I was expecting to pay anywhere from 35 to $175 to get into this goddamn country. That's all I knew. So uh, I made the mad dash. I found the visa place. I walked up and there were a bunch of dudes in suits kind of orbiting the joint, but it didn't look like anybody was really in line. But I know you're not supposed to line up. You got to get a number right away. So I ran up to pull a number and I got number 72. And then uh, there was a guy in the passport little kiosk and uh, he looks at me, he says, passport. And I handed him my passport and he made a copy of it and he didn't charge me anything. And as he said, uh, here's your copy, he handed it to me. He's like, here. And he handed me my passport back and he goes, he taps on the table. And there's a card that I have to fill out. So I get it. He hands me a pen and uh, I start to fill it out. And the pen is, of course, dead. So I got a fish in my computer bag. I grab my own pen. I start filling it out. And I hear them call 71, which doesn't make any sense because I'm number 72 and I just fucking walked up. I mean, all those dudes in suits are there. There's other people sitting down in seats. Uh, I've got now my photostat copy of my passport and I'm filling out my card and he goes, 71. And uh, I'm waiting and I'm, I'm trying to fill out this card. I'm about halfway through and he goes, 72. And I hear 72 and I turn around and the guy at the window has number 72 and there's nobody else there. And I'm waiting, but I don't have the card filled out. But I'm like, that's me. And he goes, he starts waving me over and I go, well, I got to fill out the card. And the passport guy goes, no, 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 go, 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 no, 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 go, 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 go. And the guy's waving me over and I go, all right, but I don't have the thing filled. Because now I'm panicking because now I don't want to be wrong. You know, I, I thought it was supposed to be a 45 minute wait. So I got this leisurely time to fill out this fucking card. Uh, and all I got to put on it is, uh, you know, my name and all my information. And then I've got to put on Ahmad's name and information because he's my fucking owner while I'm in town. He's my keeper. He's got to make sure that I don't do anything fucking stupid. And believe me, he has never had a greater task in his life. He's never had a more difficult task ahead of him than to make sure I didn't do anything stupid. So I'm in the middle of filling it out. There's 72. And the go, go, go. No, no, no. Go, go, go. And the guy's waving me. So I go, fuck it. So I go over there. And the guy goes, passport. And I hand him my passport. And I go, I, I have to fill. He goes, fill out, fill out. So I'm filling out the card. And he goes, uh, why are you here? And I said, pardon me? And he goes, why are you here? And I go, well, you called my number. And he goes, no, no, no. Why are you here in the country? It's so stupid. Why are you here? You called my number. No, why are you here in the, in the country? I said, oh, I'm, I'm visiting on vacation, visiting a friend. And uh, he goes, fill out, fill out. And I fill out the thing. And he, he does the thing with my passport. And he takes the fucking photocopy. He goes, put finger here. And I had to put my finger down on a, like a scanner. And then he, he goes, all right. He like, like, does two staple things. And he goes, here. And he hands me a fucking entry visa. It took six minutes. Not even four minutes. I was told 45. It's fucking amazing. Meanwhile, there's all these other dudes in suits who are haggling and arguing and negotiating. Dude, I was in the fuck. Maybe, you know, because I was dressed like a goof. I don't know, because I was just wearing normal clothes. Any guy in a suit, he has to prove that he's important. They're just like, ah, who's this idiot? Just let him in. But they did. Four minutes, I got in the door of the country. <laughs> I walked out. And so then I got to go pick up my bag. Uh, and my bag is downstairs at the big carousel. And, uh, and I got to tell you, dudes, you know, I walked to the airport and I started, you know, I took a couple of selfies, these welcome to Kuwait selfies, and I'm taking pictures and people are looking at me. And again, um, there are a few European people scattered throughout the airport. I can see them, but, uh, you know, I, they might be white. They might be American. I don't know, but nobody, I mean, it just, they, they're all, we're all getting, we are clearly the minority. So we're getting looked at and it's very strange. And also I'm a big dude. So they're looking at me and I'm walking with purpose. And, uh, and I'm kind of fascinated by everything. I'm looking, I'm poking my head in the shops and I realize Ahmad is waiting for me, but I'm like, there's no way my bag is down there, but fuck, I got to get down there. So I take a few more selfies 
And then I take a couple more pictures of like guards because there's actually, because that's another thing. Uh, I, I don't know who I think I am. There's soldiers in the airport and then there's Kuwaiti police in the airport. I'm taking photos of them. Like I'm walking up and just taking a photo of a dude and it's like, what are you, dude, what are you doing? I mean, these aren't tourist attractions. These are fucking cops. They have guns, man. Uh, but for some reason they were all smaller than me. They didn't look threatening at all. They were real tiny dudes and they were just kind of leaning like they weren't doing anything. So I'm like, all right, I'll get a photo of that dude with his weird mustache. Um, but it, it just, I don't know. It felt like the thing to do and it was dumb. So I go downstairs to get my luggage and, uh, it's just as bad as you would think. I mean, it is just piles upon piles of people and children and chickens and, uh, everything. I mean, it is, it is just crammed as my plane was. So everybody's waiting to get their bags. And uh, I'm standing next to, you know, a bunch of, it's, it's all Muslims and they're all waiting for their luggage. So in America, when you're waiting on that carousel and the bags go by, uh, if you see your bag, you have to grab it really quick. And then it's, you know, if it's heavy or whatever, you got to try to drag it off of there because otherwise you're holding up the line and people want to get their bag or you don't want to be in anybody's way. And you also want to make sure that you get your stuff. So, Bags are coming through, not mine. Bags are coming through, not mine. I'm standing by a family. And then a bag comes through. And the guy next to me, he's got a skull cap on and a, and a big beard. And uh, he reaches down to grab the suitcase. But he can't get a handle on it. He tries to grab one, both handles, but he misses one handle. So he's just, all he's doing is holding it. You ever see anybody do that? They're, they can't get their suitcase off the carousel. And the other bags are starting to come and knock it around. And he's trying to dra- drag it off the belt. And so uh, everybody just kind of standing there. And so because I'm a nice person, it's what I would do in America. Uh, I reach over and I grab the other handle of the bag. He's got the top handle. I grab the side handle and I lift it up and to put his bag down. And he's so he's got his left hand holding the top of the suitcase. I take my right hand and I lean and I grab the handle on the side of the suitcase and I go to lift it up and he takes his right hand and he hits me three times in the shoulder. Stop! No! No! And, and I, I, so I let go of the fucking bag. But this time, though, I've lifted it off the belt and it lands on the ground. And I, I looked at him and he goes, "No, no, my bag, my bag." And uh, and he was Indian or or Pakistani. I don't know. I couldn't I couldn't place it. It's you know what? When people here are angry, they all sound the same. I'm going to go ahead and be comfortable in saying that racist blanket statement. Uh, you know, anger has a universal language. I'm sure I would have sounded like this fucking dude too. But uh, all I was doing, I was just trying to help. But, but just, you know, you know, no, 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 my bag. And, uh, and I mean, he hit me, he hit me, like slapped me three times in the shoulder. And, uh, and I go, I'm just trying to help. And he goes, no, no, no help. And, and he's, and in America, if you hit me three times, you know, I'm, I'm, I might react a little weird, but in my head, I'm like, dude, there's cops with guns all over the fucking place. Like, don't do anything stupid here. And I, he didn't hit me hard, but he, he was just, just that kind of like, don't do that type of thing, but you don't hit another person, right? Especially like me. Why would you hit me? But I, but you, I, he did, he tagged me three times on the fucking shoulder and, uh, and I dropped his bag and he's just standing there. And, and again, if you hit somebody, cause I, I look, I've done dumb things where I've erupted and I've done something foolish, like put my hand through a wall or done some f- fucking reaction. And you know what you do afterwards? You skulk away and you hope nobody remembers it. You go, ah, fuck. What did I do there? I lost my fucking patience. I lost control. And everybody there thinks I'm an asshole. I gotta get the fuck out of here. You know what this guy did after hitting me three times and yelling at me? Nothing. He was fine with it. He stood there waiting to get the rest of his bags. If I'm him, I fucking, I slink off and I actually, I actually get in a fucking taxi and go back to Dubai. I mean, what the fuck, man? You just hit a guy in front of everybody. Everybody looked at you, but nobody, nobody even fucking batted an eye. Nobody blinked. I guess I, I don't know if hitting's a thing, and, but in my head, I'm like, all right, if hitting's a thing, this is going to be a fucking great 10 days. I can't wait to fucking jack somebody. Uh, no, no, no. My bag. Yeah, I know it's your bag. Just trying to fucking help. <laughs> he's just looking at me and standing there and he's waiting for more of his bags. So then I'm waiting for my fucking suitcase. So I, now I, you know, he doesn't move. He stays there and I'm like, well, uh, all right. So you know what I did? I moved. I went, you know what, dude, maybe you got to show a little ass here. It's time for you to move. I can't, cause I couldn't stand by the guy the rest of the time. Part of me wanted to, cause part of me wanted to help with every single bag that came off the belt then at that point and see if he would smack me every time. No, 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 my bag. Oh, oh this is your bag. Okay. Just helping. All right. Fuck you. Just help it again. Uh, but instead I was like, cause people are starting to look at me like I did something wrong. And I also, Ahmad's coming and I just put his name on a fucking sheet of paper that says he's my keeper. And I don't want to cause a fucking problem for that dude. So I'm like, all right, just move. So I moved to the other side of the carousel. I'm waiting for my bag. 
and uh, I see like a matronly white woman. She looked like a grandmother. She's probably like 65, maybe. 60, 65. Uh, she looked like Susan Boyle. You know that singer, Susan Boyle? She looked like her. And she's a little dowdy. But, you know, she had just flown, I'm sure, 8 million miles to fucking get here. And uh, so she's standing there kind of timidly. And I walk. So I stand by her because I know she's not going to fucking hit me. So I'm standing by her and we're both looking. We're waiting for our bags. And uh, a couple more dudes walk up and they cut in front of us kind of and they're looking for their bags and she takes a step back. And she just looks like she has no idea where the fuck she is, where she's landed. She looks like she might be on the fucking moon. And uh, she's looking around. She's glancing. And she uh, she kind of leans forward to me. And I'm leaning forward looking for my bags and she's leaning and she taps me on the shoulder. I turn around. And I go, hi. She goes, hello, yes. And I said, yes. She goes, did you see those men? And she points at the three dudes who just walked up to the fucking carousel. Um, two of these dudes are in dish dasas. And one guy is wearing just like a button shirt and slacks. But they have skull caps on and they have heavy rimmed glasses and they have beards. Um, the long beards, but with no mustache. So it's not like a goatee or anything, but just, you know, that look where it's just the, the long beard. All three of them look basically the same. And she goes, did you see them? And I said, I said, yeah, those guys? And she goes, yes. She goes, did they look suspicious to you? And uh, <laughs> look, man, I'm in an airport in Kuwait. It's my first time out of North America. If I wanted to be that guy, I could say that everybody in this fucking building looks suspicious to me. If I wanted to be programmed by Fox News or whatever the fuck, I could look around and go, yeah, I think all these dudes got something in their fucking pants. Uh, they're, they're, we're all going to go up in flames. Like I, I, but it was just, it was so outlandish to me that she would think that, look, you're, you're in their country now, okay? Like if you're in England, maybe that see something, say something bullshit still works and you can suspect some guy who just went out for a sandwich and you want to go ahead and call the fucking, the, the cops so they throw him in the loo or the lorry or whatever the fuck you guys have instead of a jail. Uh, but but I, I just felt... Uh, you know what I felt? This is true. I felt small when she said it. I felt because she thought that I was the one that she could trust. And I'm a fucking goof. You know what I mean? I mean, I'm, I'm just as... Uh, we, we're the outsiders. There's no reason you get to judge. If there's, those guys should be looking at us and going, hey, look at, the, look at that old lady and that fucking weird dude. Are they suspicious? That guy that, that just got hit by an old man? Can't possibly they're suspicious, do you think? But I felt small. I felt so... Her, her judgment of other people actually consumed me in a way where I just went, I, I, it made me feel bad for the world, if that makes any sense. So she, again, she just goes, do, do they look suspicious to you? And uh, I, I was just crestfallen and I looked at her and I went, look at my hair. Because I had just gotten a haircut before I left town. So I've got, you know, my hair is all pulled back in a fucking ponytail. It's shaved on the sides and the back. And, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't exactly look like your normal citizen either. So I don't know why the fuck she thinks that I would think anybody else in the building was suspicious of anything. How about the guy with the weirdest fucking haircut in the, in the and it's not even a weird haircut. It's, you know, I like my haircut. I'm not bitching about my haircut. But I'm just saying, if you're going to think three dudes who are dressed appropriately for the country... And who have beards that are actually just what their religion says it should be. If you think they're the suspicious ones and you're coming to talk to me in my, in my fucking gym shorts and my fucking crazy haircut after I just got slapped around by a fucking Indian uncle. I mean, dude, I, I so I looked at her, I, lo I went, just look at my hair. That's all I said. And she kind of nodded and just went, oh, oh, okay. I just, I was just wondering and I just fucking shook my head. And then I moved again because I couldn't handle being with her because then I didn't want like I didn't want the Indian uncle to take a couple more swipes at me. But then I didn't want to be lumped in with like the two white people who were cowering in fear from everybody that was around them. It just it was just it felt it made me feel small. God damn it. So weird. So I, I went to the other side because it was a large carousel. There's many sides. <laughs> I avoided the Indian uncle and I went over and finally my bag came rolling out, grabbed it and just made the move. And I turned around and uh You've got to, it's funny, they check your bags on the way out too. I thought that was kind of funky. Like they have to run it through a metal detector on the way out of the airport. And that was where I got the first taste of the, like the Indian and Pakistani guys who were so fucking sad. 
<laughs> and then just they got these fucking terrible looks on their face like, eh, let me do another suitcase before I die, please. Oh, please, please give me your suitcase. Please to investigate before I, I leave this earth and visit Vishnu. Oh, Vishnu, please embrace me with your eight arms of death. <laughs> or is that Ganesh? Vishnu or Ganesh, one of you, please, you have eight arms. Open them wide to hold me in my death as I leave this country. One more time as I look at a suitcase, please kill me. Take me. Oh, take me. I don't know if that's an Indian baggage inspector or Triumph the Insult comic dog. I'm not sure who it is. But, uh, but they're just sad and glowering. And Ahmad had told me to meet him at KFC, which cracked me up. Did you? Because I, I didn't, like, I, in my head, I'm like, is that Kuwaiti fried chicken? That couldn't possibly be Kentucky, right? That's not us. But I walk out of the airport. There's a food court, man. There's a fucking, there's a KFC and a McDonald's and a Burger King. And, uh, and then there's Ahmad. And uh, for, I should tell you this. Ahmad is, is just as tall as I am. He might be, he might actually have a, a half inch on me. Um. Because he, he even said, like, he's like, I thought you were 6'2". That wasn't the first thing he said, but he's, he said it this week. I thought you were 6'2". I go, I am 6'2". And he, and, uh, and he goes, well, I'm only like six foot or 6'1". And then I, I stood up straight next to him, and I could see eye to eye. And I said, no, nah, you might be 6'2". I don't know, maybe it's the sandals talking. I don't know. Um, but, yeah, but, I, but that made me laugh that he thought it. He's like, yeah, you're, I, yeah you were, <laughs> you're, you're smaller than you sound on podcasts. I, that was the only thing I could figure what he was saying. Um, but he met me by the KFC, and then uh, I was like, dude, can I get a water, please? And, uh, and I should tell you, he, he is, I'll get into this later in the week, but he just, he told me, I go, look, I go, I don't have money, I have American money. And he's like, you're not going to spend any money this entire week. I go, no, no, I, I honestly, and he goes, dude, don't insult me, please, put your wallet away, it's ridiculous. And he's, by the way, he speaks perfect English, just a nice guy, because like I said, everything here is the same, but different. We stop and get some water, and... Uh, we head to his car. He's got a Mer- like I said, he's got the Mercedes, which I talked about earlier. And uh, we head to the Hilton. Now, he, you know, I told him where we were going, and he's like, I didn't know you were going to pick this Hilton. Because I had asked him. I said, dude, where should I stay? He goes, well, there's, you know, there's all sorts of airports all over the or, uh, hotels everywhere. So just pick one. And, uh, and so then I picked the Hilton because, A, I'm a Hilton Honors member, but also friend of the show, David Watson. Uh, I had contacted him and I said, Hey, is there anything you can do in Kuwait? Like you had any stroke overseas? There's a Marriott. There's a, you know, a Hilton. And I thought the Marriott would be like the knockoff ones. I'm like, yeah, if you can do the Marriott. And he wrote me, he goes, well, I can get you into the Hilton. Uh, well, the Hilton, like I said, is the one I wanted to go to. It's got a fucking ice room and a steam room. And it's, it's dudes, it's, it's got its own private beach. Like I said, I, I, you look out my window, there's the fucking Persian Gulf. So, uh, I, I, I wind up, uh, telling him we're going to the Hilton. Well, he tells me, you know, he tells me where his house is, and he says the Hilton is like fucking 20 miles from his house, basically. He's like, I didn't think he'd be staying out here. I'm like, well, I asked you, motherfucker. You know, <laughs> I said, where should I stay? Give me a place. And he's like, well, there's a bunch of hotels around my house. I'm like, well, if you would have given me one of those, I would have fucking stayed there. So he takes me to the hotel. I check in. He says, I'll come back and get you for lunch. So he drops me off. I check into the hotel, and uh, they were incredibly gracious and very nice at the front desk. And, you know, they, of course, they spoke perfect English, but there's a bunch of sheiky dudes around and, and women in hijabs and women in burqas and um, again, I'm, I'm out of place here, but I'm not made to feel out of place. Uh, I go to go upstairs. There's only two floors here, but I'm on the second floor. As I'm walking through the hallway, there's people cleaning the rooms. And my, you know, the first few days I only saw men cleaning the rooms. I thought it was only men who cleaned the rooms here. But then recently I've seen some, uh, Asian women who, who are working cleaning the rooms. I don't know if they're from Singapore or where they're from. But they all, you know, they all speak very good English and they all want to talk to me. It's ridiculous. Like I walk down and they're like, hello, sir. How are you, sir? Is it okay for you, sir? Do you need any help today, sir? Would you like any service, sir? They're really friendly, really nice. And uh, so I check in, I get in the room. They've got like water, there's a fridge. It's just a fucking, you know, it's, 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 an, it's a really nice hotel room in a really nice hotel. And I wait for him to pick me up for lunch. He comes to grab me and he's like, you hungry? Did you eat? I said, no. So we went to some cafe down the street and I was hoping, like I, I should tell you, we just drove, there's a Domino's, there's an Applebee's, there's a Chili's, there's a Texas Roadhouse, all within like fucking rocks throwing distance of my goddamn hotel. Uh, but I'll be honest with you, me being here, that's all I want to do is throw rocks at those places. I mean, fuck, I wouldn't need an Applebee's in America. I, I wouldn't give a fuck. I, I would, I would, if there was an Applebee's, it was the only thing that was there, I would eat the next day when I went to another city. I'm not a fan. Even and the best part was Ahmad is like, oh yeah, Applebee's is fucking atrocious. 
And again, I came here with this weird mindset of thinking it's going to be so different. Everything's going to be unbelievable that I'm going to have to educate Ahmad about like America. And I'm t- dude, Ahmad went to college in America. He went to the University of Colorado. He knows everything. He knows where everything is. He knows, about, you know, I, I, every time I try to, I'd catch myself explaining something like, yeah, you know, in America, we have this thing called direct TV. Yeah, we got direct TV here. Yeah, we got satellite dishes. We got all, you know, he goes, I had, we had people at direct TV back home and I, you know, I had cable there in America. I liked it better than the dish. We're having all these philosophical conversations. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to educate him about America. And he's going to educate me about Kuwait. Well, fuck this guy knows already all there is to know about America. You probably educate me about fucking America. Uh, so I, I have nothing to impart. I have no wisdom to impart in this part of the world. All I can do is exist and be taken back and forth by Ahmad to lunch and wherever the fuck we're going to go. So we go to lunch, uh, and the first day, you know, he, I see the menu and it had, uh, you know, they had like lemonade with mint, which I like. And then he's like, yeah, get what you want. Cause they had hummus and fatouche. And I'm really familiar with this food. A lot of it, you know, hummus and fatouche salad and, and shish to wook and, kebabs i love all that stuff but you know i wanted to get different stuff too while we were here so we ordered like masuk chicken which is it was weird it was like almost like a pizza it was a flatbread with like chicken and onions and stuff all over it and uh and then a side salad that came with it which was really good and so he and i just hung out and had lunch and we drove around a little bit and looked at stuff and uh he goes all right i'm gonna take you back to the hotel we have dinner planned so i mean by this time it's i think it's we finished lunch at like 2 30 and he said i'll be back to get you around eight for lunch uh, so if you want to go or for dinner, so if you want to go home and get some sleep, that would be a good plan. So I, I went back to the hotel and I was like, I'm too wired to sleep, man. I'm going to go to the pool. I'm going to go to the hot tub. I'm going to go do something like that. And I got into my room and, uh, yeah, I just, I laid down and crashed. Like I, I just, I slept like two and a half hours and then woke up. It was just, just because of the, the, the wonderment of everything was wearing off a little bit. And plus, you know, there's a 10 hour time difference and I flew for 16 hours. It was all just fucking kind of backing up. I was, I was holding it off as best I could, but I kept yawning. I kept going, all right, well, it's happening here. But I, I slept about two and a half hours, got in a shower and, uh, he came to pick me up and we've been communicating via WhatsApp. It's uh, he told me that's probably the best way to do it. But then when I got here, he texted me and it worked. So he's like, oh, I'll just text you on your phone. I said, great. So he tells me he's downstairs. I go down to meet him and he takes me to dinner. And this is where the, we, went to, we went to the Al Tajai Tower, I think, or Tahaji, Tahaji, I don't fucking know. Uh, it's a big ass corkscrew looking tower with blue, and blue red lights. It's, it's really beautiful. I mean, it's a beautiful skyscraper. So uh, we drive over there, we park, and he tells me, he's like, yeah, we get dinner at a, it's a Turkish steakhouse. So we go up, it's a place called Sultan Chef. And it's so weird because it is, you know, to me, you eat in a mall and you're eating in a fucking mall. You know, it, it's fucking uh, Panda Express and all that nonsense. You know, it's it's nothing fancy. It's food in a goddamn mall. But we go up to, I don't know what floor it was, but we went all the way up and we get out of the elevator. And I didn't, you know, he told me that he had some friends, but I, we get to the table and there's there's like eight dudes there or six dudes, six dudes waiting for us. And uh, I meet everybody and and they, you know, we sit down. And there was, uh, who was there? There was uh, Abdullah, and then there was Blind Abdullah. <laughs> well, I'll tell you about in a second. There was Awaz, there was Muhammad, there was me, there was Khalid, there was Muhammad, uh, and then there was Ahmad, and then there was, an, fuck, there's another guy that I keep forgetting. Was it, was it Hamid, maybe? I met another Hamid later, and I met a Yasser. I'll, I'll talk about those guys later. But, um, fuck, I, I cannot believe, I can't remember this other dude's name. You know, because I forgot it once. And then I asked him, I was like, just give me the first letter. And he did. And I knew it. Shit. Khalif. Fuck. Um, regardless, I sat down. And I'm, I sit next down to Blind Abdullah. Blind Abdullah is called Blind Abdullah because he is just that. He is basically blind. He, his eyes started to deteriorate a few years ago. Uh, and he can't, he just can't see very well. However, he still has a driver's license. <laughs> right which uh which is perfect because i'll tell you what driving in this country what a fucking circus like I, ahmad is the worst tailgater he and I, I tell him that and he's just like oh man everybody in this country tailgates i'm like yeah i don't care i don't want to fucking die don't tailgate i don't know why i'm that pest who keeps telling i have that problem everywhere i go and everybody drives me around i just don't like the way they do it but then i get told i'm a shitty driver but i'm a good driver i promise i'm, I'm an excellent i'm an excellent driver um but no but ahmad tailgates but he admits it he's just like yeah i, I tailgate that's what we do 
but he's behind SUVs and you can't see what's going on in front of them. So if somebody hits the fucking brakes, we're going to die. And I tell him that and he's just like, nah, that never happens. I'm like, oh man, it hasn't happened yet. You're fucking 26, man. If I was you, I'd take some precautions here. Why not? Uh, but also driving, you know, I, I don't know anything about the signs and I don't know anything about the traffic. First of all, there's a stop sign and they say they have English words and numbers on them, but then they also have the Arabic translation. So uh, my favorite is we come to a crosswalk and there's a blue sign and it's got Arabic writing. And then it just says crossing the red signal leads to death or prison. Really? Fuck. I Look, I knew that you would stone adulterers in this country and you cut the hands off of thieves, but crossing the red signal leads to death or prison? Man, don't fuck around at a crosswalk in Kuwait. That's the message you get. Uh, we're driving. There's viaducts, you know, those like kind of overpasses that go over the freeway. And all of them have like Arabic writing or these inspirational things. And one of them, it just said, your driving is a symbol of your civilization. And uh, which... I, I thought about it and I, I, in my mind, I was like, well, I, I really hope not because there are no yellow lines on this, this highway and everybody keeps just driving like psychopaths. They're all tailgating. I mean, if this, if this driving is a symbol of their civilization, that means everybody's up everybody else's ass. I mean, they're just on top of one another. And there are dudes because there's, you know, there's a ton of fucking money here. So there's guys in Ferraris and they're bolting around everybody and these guys in these SUVs and they don't fucking think about it. They just, they, they just fucking tailgate you and they drive around you. It's just... It's a zoo. There's roundabouts here too, but they don't. He kept running stop signs, Ahmad. I go, dude, that's a stop sign. Yeah, that's a stop sign. And he would say, stop signs here are just suggestions. And he would, he went through all, he never stops. He goes through all of them at the round. I mean, if, unless somebody's coming, you know, he looks to see if someone's coming the other way. If he does, then he fucking stops. But if there's nobody there, nobody stops. Uh, if there's no oncoming traffic or cross traffic, people just go through the stop signs. They don't, they don't even fucking think about it. Uh, I learned that in one night when his friend Hamad was driving, or Hamed, Hamid was driving. Hamid was driving, and uh, he, he turned down the wrong way on a street to cut into traffic on the other lane. Like, it was, he even went, ah, ah. Like, he, he knew he was going to do it, and he laughed about it, and then he just turned, directly drove into oncoming traffic, and then, uh, and then was able to merge into his lane before anybody showed up. There were three cars coming, but he was able to avoid them. Uh, we saw yesterday two guys parked, they were delivery guys, and the guy, the delivery guy on the motorcycle drove over the median into oncoming traffic and then cut across a parking lot. It just people don't even fucking think. So if driving is a symbol of their civilization, everybody's in a, this civilization's in a fucking hurry. <laughs> they, they all got somewhere to go quickly. And also, they don't care too much about signs. So I don't know why driving is a symbol of your civilization. It should not be a sign, because nobody's going to fucking uh, pay any attention to it. So we, uh, so blind Abdullah is, is next to me and he's, you know, he literally, he has trouble finding his fork. Like he's, he's that dude. Um, and, and he's being helped. You know, I met Muhammad, I met Khalid was, uh, he, he went to kindergarten. I mean, Ahmad's known him since kindergarten and he was wearing a pride fighting shirt. So I knew he was an MMA guy. We started talking about that. We started, you know, they all, Ahmad and Khalid, uh, Khalid, Khalid, I keep calling him Khalid, Khalid. They, they know, <clears throat> they, they know pro wrestling. Uh, they like metal music. Uh, and you know, we, so we start talking about that and Khalid knows who I am because Ahmad had him listen to never not funny. So he knows like how I talk and he knows, he knows, how do I put this? He knew that I was going to be funny. Like he knew coming in that I would be funny. And the best part is I could make him laugh. Like I made Khalid laugh and it made me happy. Like I would say something silly or something foolish and, and you know, or, or a joke, I would make a joke and he would laugh at it and he got it. Um, but to my surprise, so did all the other guys at the table. Like I would make a joke and they would laugh or they would smile. Like they would understand that I was being funny. They, they, they thought I was weird too because they were like wondering who the fuck this dude is. Um, but they, they were really, all of them were really welcoming and, and really great to me. I mean, I would ask questions. Like I said, I asked questions about burkas and swimming and, you know, what do you do here and it, where do you go to church and who goes to school and where do you work and what do you want to do? And I found out so much about these guys. You know, they, they were willing to answer every question. And then they asked me, how do you like Kuwait? You know, where are you from in America? And, uh, but again, they all have international experience. These guys have traveled. They know, you know, I, again, like I said, as an American, you become extremely provincial. And you think you're going to come to town and you're like, oh, I'm going to tell these people what's what. But these people are so much more sophisticated than me. I mean, they, you know, I, I've just been a guy who's been around the States. And I was in Toronto, which is beautiful. But, I mean, it's not like traveling completely internationally. Toronto's just, you know, it's just cold America. Uh, don't get mad at me, Toronto. I'm teasing. 
but but these places, you know, the and because these places they're 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 in Kuwait, but then they also go to Europe and they they've come to America. They've been all over. They're certainly more cultured and more educated, more sophisticated than I am. So I would talk to them and ask them questions, and they would laugh. And and uh, I found out so much about the culture. I found out that uh, you know virtually all these guys live at home, and and they're 26. Some of them are still like Khalid is still studying in school. Abdullah is still studying in school. Blind Abdullah is an IT guy. Uh, which is incredibly ironic that the word that I would be in anything that he does. Um, and, and they were all just, they were just incredibly nice and gracious and warm and welcoming. And they, and, uh, and laughed, like I said, that was the best part is they, they didn't, they didn't not talk to me. They didn't wonder who this weirdo was. They genuinely were curious about who I was and what I wanted to do. And and they wanted to make plans and we were going to get together later in the week. And it was really, really great. Uh, we were at a Turkish uh, steakhouse, like I said, it was called um, Turk. What was it? Sultan Chef. And the the hook of Sultan Chef is they put on a show, like they set shit on fire, and they got two dudes come over in like crazy hats, and uh, and they have mustaches, and they chop all the meat in front of you. First thing they brought us was kofta stuffed with cheese, and uh, and they were these basically these these fucking little chunks, not even little. But that's the thing. I can't eat. You know me. I can't eat like I used to eat. So. They bring out this fucking kofta stuff with cheese. That's the first course. Well, actually, bullshit. They brought out a salad. I should tell you that. They brought out this fucking salad. And, uh, I mean, what a goof. Because, you know, the place is a steakhouse. So it's just going to be never-ending fucking piles of meat flying at your head. And then they bring out this ridiculous salad first. And it just, it was like a shot glass with a carrot and a lettuce leaf in it. It was so fucking bad. Like, it was just like a, a radish with a winky face emoticon on it. Like, yeah, come on, we both know you're not going to eat this bullshit salad. I mean, <laughs> literally, it was like, here, you guys, take a smell, take a whiff of this salad, and then start eating a zoo. I mean, it was that fucking crazy, because that's all it was. It was just, hey, it, it wasn't even like, you know what, a salad for us. It was a display of what these things you were about to eat would eat if they were still alive. That's all it was. Hey, you know, see these see this radish and this fucking cherry tomato? and this carrot and this one lettuce leaf that's what this fucking cow would have eaten if we would have left him alive but no instead you motherfuckers came here and executed him for your own enjoyment good for you uh so they took away the cursory salad and they brought out the fucking meat first thing was the kofta stuff with cheese and it was so delicious but it was that thing where again i I eat one of them you know i eat one pot and i'm already getting full you know and i i can't Look, I can't be a guy who throws up every meal. You know what I mean? I can't be that dude. And I, and I also, I, you know, I don't throw up if somebody else is paying. That's the rule. I can't do it. So they bring out the kofta and I eat, and I eat one of them. It was about the size of a pot sticker. And it was, but it was meat. It was a meat, a meat sticker. <laughs> and it was stuffed with cheese too on top of it. So I eat it and it's, I love kofta. It's this spiced ground beef and it was so delicious. So I eat that thing and already I go, well, fuck, I'm in trouble because I mean, I ate that thing and I'm like, oh, you know, I could eat because I wanted to eat like three of them and then I would have been done. That could have been my meal. I could have had three fucking kofta pods and been finished. But instead I ate one because I knew I had to pace myself because I knew there was more food coming. So then the second course they bring out, uh, there's a show. Okay. They bring out like beef. It, it was essentially short ribs, but it was the, it was the full short rib. It was probably a foot long, two bones, short ribs on the bones, two, two beef bones. I don't know what the fuck you want to call them. All I know is they fucking, they take them out and they, they have their knives and they like do this like fucking, and it's two dudes. Our, our server was a guy named Ulas and he was Turkish and, uh, they start chopping the, the meat up and then Ulas would take chunks of meat and he would come over and he'd go, eh, Turkish airplane. And he would, literally holding it in his fingers, he would shove it in your mouth. Uh, that was their hook. That was the deal as they would feed you this meat. So uh, he's coming around. And I, you know, I, I didn't know that they would feed it. Like Ahmad, he had told me a story that like they had, they had shoved some food in a guy's mouth. And, he, and I, I laughed because I thought it was like a one-time thing like because it, it was the guy's birthday. But instead, no, dude, that's what they fucking do for everybody. They just start shoving food in everybody's mouth. So this, these dudes come out and they're chopping the beef chunks and they're shoving them in like, you know, Muhammad got one, Blind Abdullah got one, Abdullah got one, Awaz got one. And, uh, and then they, they hit everybody. They're passing out Turkish airplane and uh, they skip me. I'm filming it too, by the way. I'm filming it and I'm like, all right, here we go. And... Uh, and they, they don't get me. They fucking bail on it. Ulas goes to walk away. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, hold on a second. How do you forget me, dude? And, uh, and he's like, oh, very sorry. And he comes over and he grabs, sure enough, he grabs a handful of meat. And I go, hold on. And uh, 
I was filming it, and then I gave him on the phone, and uh, and I made I made him. He put it on a fork, and he put it in my mouth, and I busted out a stool look, and I had a huge chunk of fucking short rib, and dudes, oh my god, it, it was. It was crazy delicious. Like, you know, I, I've talked about this before. Like, you know, I mean, beef is just, you know, if you have a shitty hamburger, you're like, eh, whatever. But if you have a really good hamburger, it's, it's a game changer. Well, this was that kind of beef that tastes like your mom made a, like a Sunday pot roast for nine hours with pearl onions and fucking carrots. And it was unbelievably delicious. And it's just this huge platter of it. And they're just, you just dig your fork in it. You know, once they get done feeding you, they put it on the table. So we've still got kofta pods. And then they bring out the fucking double barrel beef. So we're eating the double barrel beef ribs. Or just, and you're just digging your fork in and eating chunks of it and pulling it off. In the meanwhile, they come over again to do another fucking show. They, they cut up this, this, it looked like it was filet mignon. And they're cutting it raw. And they're chopping it raw. And then they're heating up a, like a plate. Like a, a, to make this plate really warm. So they put the filet mignon on the plate and it's cooking, sizzling while on the plate. And they pour this like sauce over it with arugula and cheese and then they blast it with a torch. And there's supposed to be like a huge fire thing, but there wasn't. Uh, but the meat cooks with all these onions and everything and then they put that plate on there. So now you're digging your fork and eating arugula and fucking cheese and filet mignon. There's still kofta pods laying around. We're eating these beef ribs and man, it was fucking amazing. They bring us like blue juice. I don't know what the fuck it was like blueberry lagoon. I forget what it was, but they brought all of it. Everybody ordered one. So I was like, I'm in. It was just some fucking soda. They taste like blueberry seven up with blueberries floating in it. God damn, it was good. And, uh, and the only, you know, again, I can't eat like I used to. If I was fucking 26, like these dudes, I would have mowed the fuck out of this. I'd still be chewing on the bone, but I, I ate, like I said, I ate one and a half kofta pods. And then, uh, I just kept pulling chunks of beef. Now I, I here's the, the difference though. You know, if I'm eating like a normal dinner in a normal time span, then I, I have to eat really slow and I can't eat a lot of food because, I mean, it, I'll fuck myself up. But if you're going to sit there with me for four hours, I'll, I'll eat all that beef. I mean, I can definitely do that. Then it, then it gives my body a chance to fucking catch up. So uh, so doing Turkish airplane, they're feeding everybody, and I'm just taking hunks of beef and I'm eating, and, I'm, and I go, I got to slow down. I can't, I can't do it. I wanted to. I wanted to eat the rest of it because it was delicious, man. The filet mignon was good, but boy, that fucking double barrel beef rib, holy God, was it delicious. And, uh, and then we're just talking and laughing. These dudes, again, they don't know who the fuck I am. I'm some guy from another country. I'm, I'm twice their age. I'm, I'm 49. They're all 26. And, uh, and they, they could not have been more friendly or accommodating. They joked. They laughed. They laughed at my jokes. They were curious about why I was here and what I was going to do and when they could see me again. Uh, there was no pretense. There was no, who's this weird dude? It was just, I was welcomed right into their fucking bosom. It was like eight dudes. It was like, cause I'll tell you what, I got eight friends and we wouldn't even be like that. We would, we'd be friendly, but then we'd probably be like, what the fuck's wrong with this guy? You know, if me and Max and fucking uh, the, the, the UN of evil, you know, Dennis is different. Dennis like is real accommodating because Dennis is usually the guy with new friends. <laughs> the rest of us, we haven't made a new friend in fucking years, except for me now. I'm making him here. Maybe I bring these dudes to meet the UN of evil. Oh my God, what a summit meeting. Um, but everybody else is just kind of, uh, you know, living their life and doing their thing. And, and, uh, and, and, you know, we, we have friends back home and we don't bring anybody new into the group when Dennis does, because that's when Dennis introduces us to all of his friends. Um, but then we're just kind of like, ah, screw those new dudes. But here, man, these dudes, they, they were really great to me. They were, they were incredibly friendly. They wanted to see me again and they wanted to hang out. So then they bring out dessert and dessert is like a pistachio covered baklava. And, uh, and they put on a show with that. Ulas has to cut it all up. He takes it out. He's got a fucking uh, diet, like a diamond shaped cutter and he's slicing it through. <laughs> so I start filming that. And he even says, he goes, he says, and he knew my name. I didn't even know where he picked my name. I was like, Mike, you want to take video? I said, of course you lost. So I start filming. He's like, <laughs> <laughs> he's fucking slicing it up into chunks. And, uh, and then he, he's got a plate of bao, like, you know what? Uh, Indian buns or, uh, Chinese buns. Uh, uh, it's like this weird bread. So he, he takes, he's opening and I'm filming and I'm not paying attention. I'm talking to people and he's opening the baklava after he takes a slice and he puts the bow in the middle of it and he presses it out. Now, if I had been paying attention, I would have realized you can't press bow out. Bow has a shape. You can't spread it inside of a baklava. It doesn't do that. So, uh, he makes the, the, the pistachio baklava and he spreads the bow in the center. And then he says to me, he's like, oh, Mike, are you ready? And I said, of course. And he's like, Turkish airliner. And uh, he takes his fork and the spoon and he cuts off a chunk. And I open my mouth and I'm, you know, again, I'm, I'm doing it for the camera. I'm going to have fun. 
And uh, he takes this giant piece of, uh, of dessert. And I, you know, if, if you've seen the video, there's a Suzy Q video floating around where I, I can put a whole fucking Suzy Q in my mouth and make it disappear. And it's ridiculous. So I figure I'm going to do that and make a joke out of this fucking baklava. So he takes it and he puts it in my mouth and I just, I let him, I just sit there and he keeps putting it in and I don't close my mouth because he's going to put it in until you close your choppers. And once you bite it, then he's done shoving. Uh, he may shove it a little bit more, but uh, instead he's putting it in. I, how bizarrely sexual is this conversation? You know, and if you bite down, he's going to stop shoving it in. But if you keep your mouth open, he's going to give you all of it. Ulas. I'm going to get the full Ulas. You are going to get the full Ulas, man, if you keep your mouth open. <laughs> So I'm ready for the full ulas. I'm just like, all right, go ahead and dump it on me. That's fucking perfect. And, uh, and sure enough, he goes, I open my mouth. He starts to put it in and then he, uh, slides it in my mouth. And I realize that's not bow, uh, in the center of the baklava that he spread out. Because again, I'm making a video. I'm having fun. I'm joking around. I, I did not know what he was going to do. He shoved it in my mouth. That's, uh, <clears throat> that's vanilla ice cream inside the baklava. So I thought I was going to put this whole piece in my mouth and make everybody, you know, astonished, but also laugh. Uh, instead he puts it in my mouth and I, I feel the cold. The second it hits the back of my throat, I feel the cold. And it just, I get that instant headache from fucking swallowing like a Slurpee too fast, you know, an ice cream headache. And, uh, the second he puts it in my throat, because now I, now I'm committed. I can't spit it the fuck out. So then when it hits the back of my throat, then I feel it's cold and I feel it fill up. And I, and so then I bite through it and, it and then my teeth get that fucking shock of cold and I make a face and I'm like, oh, dude. And everybody just starts fucking cracking up because they, you know, I think they thought that I knew it was ice cream and I was pulling a fucking gag. Dude, I had no idea. I thought it was bow until it hit the back of my throat. And then I'm like, oh boy. And I got brain freeze immediately and my fucking head exploded. And I was like, Ugh. and I, and then I'm trying to chew it. And I didn't, again, I didn't want to be messy and I didn't want to spit it out, but I, I started chewing it and I'm like, uh, and they're laughing and I'm fucking, so then I drink some water and like fucking just do anything to fix my head. Uh, <laughs> but it was beautiful. I mean, I was, I was on board. Uh, and then I realized I had misjudged completely the ingredients, but it was okay. It worked out. Uh, and, and then we laughed and we talked and then they got teas and they got coffees and I, I, you know, I'm not a tea or coffee guy. Um, and we just talked and we hung out. I will say this too. When everybody's done eating at these things, they, they're done eating. They get up and get the fuck out. Uh, we've got, I've been to a few sit down dinners now and uh, all of a sudden everybody's like, we're done. And they go to leave. There's no real lingering around the table and talking. It's just like, yeah, let's go. So we got up to split. Uh, they brought the check. I should say this. They brought the check out and I reached my wallet and fucking Ahmad's like, dude, don't even ridiculous. And, uh, I saw the check when he opened up the little thing and it's, you know, of course written in, in fucking different language, but I see the total at the bottom because I wanted to make a note of it. So they bring the check and everybody reaches for their wallets and Ahmad goes, no. And he puts his, his credit card in and he goes, I got it. And everybody's like, oh, okay. And they just nod and they put their wallets away. So it was 237 dinar. Uh, and so he pays for it. We go and we split. We, uh, and I say goodbye to everybody and I make plans. I'm, I'm supposed to see Khalid again and I'm, I'm, I'm making plans to see everyone. There's going to be a possible get together later in the week. Nobody knows, but it was really nice to meet everybody. And uh, we go downstairs and I ask Ahmad if I can go to a grocery store. And uh, we go into this actual grocery store and they had fucking weird, you know, like they got Frosted Flakes candy bars and, and, but they're not called Frosted Flakes here. I forget they're called like Sugar Flakes or something. And it's fucking great. And he was very nice. He indulged me as I walked around and I found garlic shampoo, which was bizarre. I bought close up with warming gel. Like, I don't even know what the fuck it is, but it's, it's got, it's like a two tone close up. Cause I was worried, you know, close up is my toothpaste. And I, so I brought a tube with me, but, uh, I went looking and I was like, oh, they got Colgate and stuff. But then they had a huge, they got more close up here than anything else. They got like eight different kinds of close up. They got a green one. They got a, you know, the red and green one. They got all this. So I, I was awesome. So I, I, and again, I know that sounds ridiculous. That would be awesome, but I loved it. And they had weird Doritos and weird chips. And, and, uh, you know, I love all that kind of stuff. So Ahmad accommodated me. We bought a case of water for the room. And, uh, we went back to the hotel and he dropped me off. He's like, all right, man, uh, you know, I'll let you know about tomorrow. And, uh, he was going to text me and WhatsApp me and, and figure out what was happening. So I get out of the Hilton. People are very nice. I walk in, go upstairs to my room and I'm gassed. I mean like crazy beat, but it's just kind of hitting me a little bit, but I want to post some stuff on Facebook. So I do, I sit down and I make myself do it. And, uh, 
I post things and I go, all right, well, then when tomorrow comes, then I'll figure out what I'm going to do and, and I'll post some more stuff. But right now, here's some pictures. And I went and I talk about ULAS and I talk about the tech, Turkish airline. I post some videos. It was really great um, because I was still a little wired from dinner and having a good time and being out. So uh, I posted everything and I was here in the room. And uh, just as I was getting up and I'm like, you know what? I'm probably going to get some sleep. Why not? Just a little bit. But you know what? Fuck that. Why don't I just wait up until 7 o'clock? Because I finished everything, it was 5 in the morning. And uh, I go, you know what, I'm going to wait up until 7 a.m. because that's when the, the spa opens. So I can go down to the spa, I can go uh, get dressed and, uh, and get in the fucking hot tub and go do the steam room and do those sorts of things. And, just, and, and then I'll, I'll maybe get a couple hours of sleep before he comes and gets me. But he's going to text me because he was talking about when he was going to pick me up. He said 3 o'clock. So I figured if I went from 7 o'clock till 9 o'clock down at the thing, I could get about 5 hours of sleep. Because I didn't want to sleep. You know, I'm here. I just want to have a good time. I want to see everything there is to see. I want to go places. I want to do things. That's my whole plan. But just before I said, you know, I'm going to lay down. But first, uh, I remember dinner. I said, I'm going to Google that and see exactly how much that was. So I Google 237 dinar. And I see that dinner costs 787 American dollars. What the fuck? And I thought of the moment when he took out his credit card, Ahmad, and he put it down. And he's like, I got this. And the guys were just like, yeah, cool. Like like nobody flinched. Nobody went, no, dude, that's ridiculous. Or, I mean, that dude paid $800 for dinner. And again, it was just cough the pods, double barrel beef rib, and a filet mignon show along with a Turkish airliner at the end. I'll tell you what, if you spend 787 American dollars, maybe, maybe you actually buy a Turkish airliner. F- fuck a, a guy with a spoon. You know what, Ulaz, I like you, but a spoon and a fork and a piece of cake jammed down my throat, that's not a $787 purchase. You better give me the whole fucking plane. You don't just get to say Turkish airliner. You go, hey, here's your keys to your Turkish airliner. $787 for dinner, first night. Holy fuck. It was amazing. And uh, I, I felt that wave of guilt and also gratitude that comes together at the same exact time. Because, uh, again, I'm here as his guest. You know, I'm, I'm here at, on Ahmad's good humor. And he told me, he goes, your cash is no good here. Uh, I mean, he, he proved it at dinner the first fucking night. 787 American dollars for dinner for him. You know, me and his whole crew. But still, I, I just... It was astonishing, and I was unbelievably grateful. And uh, like I said, also felt a little uh, silly, um, you know, that you get that self-worth thing going, and you're like, what did I do to deserve this? Why, am I, why is this happening? Um, and maybe I don't deserve it, but it's happening. And, uh, and I need to realize that it's happening because Ahmad wanted me here, and, and because of the show is a success, and he likes it, and all good things. You know, I, I even put that on Facebook when I'm like, you know, I'm about to go use the steam room and the ice room here in the Hilton in Kuwait because a listener thought I was worth it. Never, ever let me complain about how terrible things are ever again. <laughs> now, will I? Of course I will. Is it your job to step up and say something? Probably not because I'll resent you for it. But what the fuck? Why not? You've now been deputized. You were all deputized before. Now you're deputized again. Remind me. Because, uh, you know, when I sat down to do this show, I couldn't do it. I kept telling myself, you know, I'm fucking hypnotized. I don't know if I should do this, do that. How's it going to be? Is it going to be good? Is it going to be bad? What's it going to be? Do you want it to be different? Do you want it to be the same? Should it just be a travelogue? Should you just go forward? And this, uh, you know, I, I, you heard the first, I think, 40 minutes of the show is me trying to get my bearings and kind of, because I have so much to tell you. I have so much to share with you, so much to bring to you and tell you about what's happened. And, uh, and I couldn't get a handle on it. I couldn't focus. I'm glad we rebooted in the middle. Because <laughs> I think I've added, a, you know, I think we've had some sort of uh, clarity added to it, and uh, and I've I was, I've been able to focus a little bit and tell you about the trip. Now, uh, I should tell you this: I've only told you about one day of the trip, <laughs> and uh, and I just looked at how much time we've gone through, and holy fuck! So. Uh, if you want to hear the rest of this, send me 787 American dollars or 237 dinar to this address. 
Uh, this is going to go on. I mean, obviously it's going to, it's going to continue for a week or two, um, because I still got, I'm still here. I got fucking things to experience and, and, and days to go ahead in front of me. And as a matter of fact, I'm not supposed to be here in like fucking 15 minutes. So, uh, so I'm excited and, uh, and I hope you are too, because I mean, I'm just having the best fucking time in the world. So this was the tale of, uh, of me trying to get focused and then, uh, able to kind of reboot a little bit. And I brought you the trip and the first day, and there are still nine days to come. And, uh, and I cannot wait to share them with you. So, uh, next week and the week after and, and, uh, stick around because, uh, the next time some little kid looks up at you with a mouthful of chips and goes, where are you going? You can say, I'm going to Kuwait with Mike motherfucker. But you're white. <laughs> you guys can get me at Mike and Mike Schmidt comedy dot com. You guys can be my friend at Facebook dot com slash the 40 year old boy. You can follow me at Twitter dot com slash the 40 year old boy. You can follow me at Instagram dot com at Instagram um, at Mike for a Y for a Y O B Mike Mike for a Y O B. Fuck, I'm going to check it while I'm talking. Um, but all of those things matter. <laughs> so go find me at everywhere you can. Uh, hold on, we're pulling up Instagram now, and I'm making this longer than I should. I am the guy who's uh, Mike40YOB. So I'm at Instagram, Mike40YOB. Um, and I'm going to be putting up a flood of pictures from here on Instagram. It's just putting them on Facebook, and then it's, it, it's a full-time job trying to document a fucking trip. So much so that I quit it <laughs> right in the middle. Um, but I, I will, I, I have so much stuff to share and I will put up on Facebook and the Joker's page and everywhere else. So please, and, you know, there's a Facebook fan club page called the West Side 86 Jokers. Go ahead and join that. And there was exclusive videos and pictures. I mean, not exclusive. They were posted there, but you can find them, but, uh, go ahead and check them out. Join the fan club. We'd appreciate it very much. Uh, Dave Hernandez does all the artwork for this show, including the picture you're looking at right now with me being pulled out of a spider hole. That was fucking fantastic. He and I talked about it. We're like, what about Saddam? Hey, the spider hole. Cause I wanted to find a spider hole. I asked him on. Uh, no, no spider holes in Kuwait. Damn it. Um, so David does all the artwork. You can be his friend at facebook.com slash David Max Hernandez. You can find him at, uh, art by DMH.com. A R T B Y D M H.com. He does all the cool stuff. Any paintings you could want. I wonder if he still has the Drexel painting. He painted Drexel from true romance, which I loved. And then, uh, he's done all sorts of guy cons and valscapes, all sorts of cool stuff. So he'll also do, uh, anything you want, custom stuff. He'll pay if you pay him. So go to art by DMH.com, contact him through there and get him on board with your project. He's happy to do it. Our friend Ryan Dirks does all the web stuff for this show. Go ahead and find our friend Ryan at facebook.com slash Ryan Dirks. And the producer of this show, who was, uh, in my opinion, greatly missed this week, I would have, could have used her to fucking shake me around a little bit, is uh, the, the brilliant Lily Von Stupp. Uh, you can find her at facebook.com slash Lily Von Stupp and just stare in awe at her page and all of her friends that you will never be because she's so packed with friends. But you can follow her at several different Twitter accounts, twitter.com slash... Uh, Hollywood BQ Fest, twitter.com slash Lily Von Stupp, twitter.com slash MNTs, and twitter.com slash Boobdini. You can also find her at Instagram at Lily Von Stupp at Instagram. And she has a Patreon page, patreon.com slash Lily, where you can support her and her endeavors. She's just been on the road touring all over the place, doing all sorts of cool stuff. Uh, but if you'd like to write her a personal note and find out if she has finally stopped having sex with Eddie after not having seen him for a week, you can write her at lily at burlesque411.com. That's lily, L-I-L-I. She got grease paint all over her thighs at burlesque411.com.
Want to remind you folks about the Monday Night Tees every Monday night at the Three Clubs on Vine at Santa Monica. Naked ladies and and lots of comedy and sometimes naked comedy and sometimes ladies. Just ladies. That's all. Standing there in their clothes, staring at you, wondering what the fuck you're doing with your clothes on. Get them off, man. That's right. Reverse burlesque this week at the Three Clubs on Vine at Santa Monica. Monday Night Tees. The crowd strips. The performers watch. Yes. Uh, I will not be in attendance. However, you go. Buy tickets. They're available at brownpapertickets.com. You can go to facebook.com slash Monday Night Tees for all of the performers who are coming, who are going, who are going, who are coming, and always too soon. Our great friend Lily Von Stupp is the producer of that show. She's fantastic. She's been on the road doing all sorts of stuff in different places. I think she was in Vermont. She was in Albany. I know she's in Vegas this weekend with Eddie, and that's just a, that's just a love thing. That's not even a performing thing. That's just a let's get naked and, and, uh, and blow a clown. Uh, that seemed aggressive. But maybe, you know what, honestly, i got to be honest, that's probably what happened. Um, so Lily is there in Vegas right now, I think, as I say this. But Monday, she'll be at the Three Clubs on Vine at Santa Monica. They've done great shows, Pokemon shows, Prince shows. They always have themed shows. There's uh, the Wayward School of Burlesque, Lily's Girls of Burlesque Wayward School thing. Always available. So go to Monday Night Tees. Dot com, I think. No, but go to go to burlesque411.com. Go to facebook.com slash Monday Night Tees. Go to Brown Paper Tickets and buy tickets. And go to patreon.com slash Lily and support Lily in all of her endeavors as she travels all over the place. I, From what I heard and I have not seen, uh, I understand Lily has, uh, she put up some topless photos for her Patreon people this past week. And I, I, I think I'm safe in saying that because she put it on Twitter, so I don't think it was any secret. But, uh, you know, Amanda Palmer does the same type of thing where she puts out nude stuff. And, uh, and it keeps people coming back. So why wouldn't you do it, folks? Go support her on Patreon and see Lily naked. Or if you donate to her, you can go ahead and get one of those little peep show things from her, uh, her 50th birthday party or 50th anniversary or whatever the fuck it was. But she's available out there for you. So do those cool things and get on board with Lily. Uh, <laughs> remember, tickets are on sale still for 2020 in September. I'm not uh, sure who's going to be there yet. I have not heard back from performers, but I know I'll be there. And along with uh, two other very funny people, that's September 19th, coming up uh, in three weeks, a month, I think so, three weeks. So tickets are available at brownpapertickets.com. Tickets are available at goldstar.com for just five bucks. So why not pick those up and come out and check out the great show where it's me and a couple of unnamed comics who are totally funny. I guarantee it. That's right. I guarantee humor. They're they're humor. Me, I'm hit or miss, but they're going to be fantastic, whoever they may be, as soon as they answer my emails. And then I can confirm them. Uh, so that's 202020, the comedy show on September 19th. And, uh, you know, if you're in town early for the pod fest, which I will be talking about in just a second, why not come out and check it out? I tried to think about doing a show on the, th- on Thursday of that week, but I don't think Lily can get the venue. And, uh, from what I understand, we may not be doing a show in October. So come to September because otherwise your next chance will be in the winter when it's, uh, it's so cold. Oh my God. Right. And you'll have to walk into the teeth of an Arctic wind just to check it out, but worth it even though I don't know the performers just yet, other than me. Hmm. Uh, let's see. Oh, so PodFest. I was talking about that Los Angeles Podcast Festival. It's September 23rd, 24th, 25th. Use our code 40YOB, 40YOB to save money. You save five bucks. I get money. They get money. You can get tickets to the show. You can get the live stream. Uh, and uh, hmm, let me, let me should I throw this out there. Yeah, why not? Yeah, I think I got a comp for somebody. Uh, I know I already have two of my comps spoken for, but I, I have, a, if somebody's in LA or coming to town and they want to get into the pod fest, uh, I have a comp and I don't know what to do. Should I tell you to donate to the show? Should I, I don't, I don't know. Some lucky listener, someone who uh, write me an essay. That's what I do. <laughs> we'll have an essay contest. Uh, and then you can go, I don't know what the fuck I just, I just thought of it because they sent me an email and I'm like, well, I got two comps already accounted for. So I, I, I have a third. So if you guys want to jump on that, let me know. Um, but that's a maybe, like I said, I don't know. Cause they change things all the time and I do too. And I, who knows? Um, but contact me and let me know if you're going to be in town. And if you're, if you're going to be in town, you don't want to come to the festival. Maybe I can just fucking see you and we can hang out. Who knows? Uh, but that podfest, uh, go to lapodfest.com, buy tickets or buy the streaming code and, uh, or the streaming live stream and use our code four zero Y O B. And it gets you five bucks off. It gets us some money and it gets you uh, either into the festival with you buy the tickets or you can get the live stream for a month at your house. And then you can watch everybody, not just me. You can watch them all. Touch them all is what Jack Buck would say, right? Is that what he says? I think it's him. Uh, please go to MikeSchmidtComedy.com, please, please. We've got all sorts of cool stuff there. Uh, mainly we've got the Joe Business page right now. 
We've got uh, shirts for sale. We've got, uh, there's still uh, two mystery shirts I have left. We have your dirt, dirt, your dirt, dirt shirts. We have CDs. We have live downloads. We have regular show downloads. Hey, if you guys have bought them, Dylan and Steve and everybody, I'm in, I'm in Kuwait. But once I get home, I'm in Denver for three days. And then I will be able to jump in and figure out exactly what the fuck I'm doing with your links and get those to you and figure it all out with uh, Dropbox and everybody else. Christ. <laughs> um, so please uh, go ahead and do that. Uh, go to the page. And there's what else do we have at the Joe Business page? The live stuff, which is, you know, Schmidt comes alive, Schmidt alive too. Stop making Schmidt. The download files, we've got tweaked audio stuff. We've got the Heroes album from Mex. We've got uh, Word Pimp Schmitty and the Misanthropic Gangster, which is out there, so you can pick that up. And uh, also, the Amazon link is on that page. Please use the Amazon link for all of your Amazon purchases. That really helps the show. Uh, we see a check at the end of the month. It helps me out, and it helps me pay rent. And, uh, you know, seeing as I've been traveling, I could really use that money this month or next or next or next. So please... What you do is you click on the Amazon banner on our page. It goes through to the Amazon store that I have not built. But up in the upper left-hand corner, there's an Amazon link. You can click on that, get into real Amazon. It uses our code, and we get credit, and you get stuff, and they get stuff. Perfect. They get money. We get stuff. You know, we get money. You get, uh, oh, wait, so what was time again? (laughs) <laughs> money plus tragedy equals so it's comedy never mind so please buy stuff they get money we get money you get stuff it's a perfect perfect balance and uh oh also remember this show is sponsored by myliq.com they don't know it but they do it myliq.com slash invite slash hfvhb that's myliq.com slash invite slash hfvhb if you want to be a lyft driver go to lyft and use the code mike m-i-k-e seven two double oh five seven that's mike m-i-k-e seven two double oh five seven and if you want to be an uber driver use d-j-z-w-one-y-t-t-u-e that's my code, DJZW, the number one, Y-T-T-U-E, all lowercase on Uber, all uppercase on Lyft, and all uppercase on MileIQ, I believe. Uh, but go ahead and use those things and get us stuff and you get stuff, and I'd appreciate it very much. And, uh, and I, I should tell you, I've, I've looked hard into the Uber thing out here. I thought to myself, you know what? This is the place for it. You got to do Uber in the Middle East. I've been looking, I've been thinking, and I'll tell you, I drove here for a day and went, fuck that. Nope, no thank you. Because nobody stops, nobody cares, everybody's weaving in and out of traffic, nobody goes any any way that they're supposed to, there's people driving up and down the wrong sides of the street. I mean, I've seen those fucking YouTube clips from Russia where people are driving in circles and staring and the dash cams are always a fucking problem. But let me tell you something, this is just as bad, except it's hot out. Like, Russia's got ice on the fucking road. Here it's just like 118 degrees of people with chic hats on, just fucking avoiding one another and just smashing. I mean, we've I've seen four car accidents since I've been here, four, you know, in know less than a week all minor fender benders nobody's killed or hurt but it doesn't fucking matter i mean i couldn't i couldn't possibly uber here i don't i mean they look weird enough at me i mean they they don't even want to look at me at the fucking mall do i really think they're going to merge me into traffic oh yeah let's let the american in that's a good plan why don't you get over in your toyota camry the american and the japanese car oh the man i'm shocked at all the cars they have here because there's like i said ferraris and maseratis and fucking you know denali's but also I just saw a Lancer on the road today and I was like, what the, I, th- I thought it was Winona Ryder from Stranger Things. I'm like, what the fuck? In, get them halfway through a recipe and cut your fucking show in half. That's it. Do an hour about Stew and then bail. And get on a plane. And then come back and revisit it two days later. Because that's the most important stew in the universe. <laughs> Were there noodles or rice involved? Stay tuned!
Bring the beat back. Bring the beat back. Here is your soup. <laughs>